A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who has joined us here for the last panel under the talking tree of this conference. As the conference is nearing its end, what could be a better way to conclude such an event by giving the stage to young and emerging professionals? These professionals will share their ideas for the future and express their vision of the world by discussing with our net zero teams. This panel is a bi-stream youth forum, which will allow these emerging professionals to interact and question our five innovation sites and build a narrative for a future focused on culture-based climate action. This stream, the stream number one of Under the Talking Tree is on indigenous and traditional wisdom on sustainable use of natural resources and the importance of traditional craft practices for climate action and livelihood sustainability. To set the ground for it, all I can say is that traditional craft practices and the use of locally available materials offer low carbon solutions that minimize waste, reduce environmental impacts and promote livelihoods. By integrating vernacular styles and techniques, human settlements can be designed to withstand harsh weather conditions. This stream has invited craftspeople, stonemasons, conservators, architects, and scientists to exchange creative solutions and identify the climate impacts of raw material sourcing. With that, I now pass on to Mohona to uh, let us know how this panel will function. Thank you, Joey. Uh, before we move on, actually, I would like to also emphasize a little bit about on why we are calling this panel under the talking tree. Uh, as Joey explained, we are gathering today, you know, thought leaders, uh, indigenous knowledge bearers, uh, practitioners, emerging professionals from different parts of the world uh, to bring them all together under this virtual branches of a, of a tree. So, you know, gathering around trees has been long uh, intertwined with the art of storytelling, creating a timeless association uh, between, you know, storytelling and gathering around trees and communities coming together. Uh, and we often see, in my context, I can tell you, uh, we often see communities under the ancient oaks uh, or, uh, you know, large canopies of trees gathering together, uh, sharing stories, sharing traditional knowledge, passing it, passing it on to the next generation. Uh, and not only that, but these trees actually provide cool shade uh, in hot weathers. And there is so much to, you know, unpack under these trees. And we wanted to bring that essence together in this panel. And uh, it is actually my great pleasure to introduce you to our two discussants who will be leading this uh, stream of this session. Uh, Boriana from the University of Cambridge, who is doing a master's in building history. And Abdullah, who is an architect from Mosul, who is working actively on documenting the heritage buildings in Mosul in Iraq. So it is uh, a great pleasure to have you both. And uh, we are bringing to you in this uh, stream examples from India, from uh, Brazil, from Philippines, from uh, Madagascar. So I'm very excited and looking forward to the discussion. And I give the floor to you, Boriana and uh, Abdullah. Hello. Oh, yeah, hello, all. For the first speaker, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Antion from Blue Ventures who has dedicated, dedicated over a decade of his life to the heart of Madagascar traditional fishing communities. Since 2013, Paul has been deeply immersed in these communities, working tirelessly to empower local fishermen and women to take the lead in the managing their marine resources sustainability, aligning the, aligning the well-being of people with the preservation of nature. Join me in welcoming and an individual who, who not only represents the essence of community uh, to environmental and social sustainability, but also embodies the spirit 
of Genuine Community Partnership. Paul Antion. Liz, uh, he is also from Madagascar, so uh, he recorded the stream. He will not be with us uh, online. Under yeah, first, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this event. The title of my presentation is called uh, Thriving Fishers, Thriving Oceans. I love the title Under the Talking Tree because this is where I've heard the stories I'm about to tell. I'm currently on the northwest coast of Madagascar and spent the last week talking to fishers in this very large and beautiful bay called the Bay of Majamba. It's a very complex bay with over 44,000 inhabitants, full of mangrove channels like these, small fishing camps like these, and larger fishing villages. On Sunday, I sat under this tree and listened to some fishers tell their stories of the changing sea increasing pressures, and changing identity. It's a story all too familiar on this coast of Madagascar. A story about people at the front line of climate change, living with the sea, and people who must go to greater and greater lengths to make a living while they watch the world around them change rapidly. And the ocean they depend on go from something like this to something like this. Around the world, approximately 500 million people depend on small-scale fisheries. These small-scale fisheries look completely different everywhere you go. Even here in Madagascar, it's drastically different up and down the western coast in terms of fishing methods and the different species they're catching and the habitats they're exploiting. But the challenges they face are quite similar. Wondering how to make a living with this ever-changing sea. But for the Vesa of Southwest Madagascar, some things haven't changed. The ocean is the lifeblood for many of them. It shapes their identity from an early age. It's their classroom. It's where they work. It's where they make a living and how they're able to earn money and support their families. However, many of the traditions that once shaped cultural identity and a harmony between the people and the resources they relied on have faded as challenges have surmounted. Many children grow up not knowing of the abundance that once was in these waters, not knowing the stories that were so vital to their previous generations, growing up with a completely different baseline. Small villages in the most remote places have grown almost exponentially, becoming more accessible, drawing more competition, both between small-scale fishers and collectors. And even still, there exists an unfair competition between small-scale fishers and industrial fishers like this. Even more a threat are the weather events, storms like these that threaten the homes and fishing grounds with rising sea levels and rising temperatures. So these fishers have seen uh, their catch of relative abundance with high diversity of large species dwindle. But this is meant to be a hopeful story because the ocean is amazing. It's like magic. It has the ability to regenerate and come back to life if the right people have the right tools to help it. 
And I've seen it with my own eyes uh, in this area, not far from shore, in a small fishing village called Bangulu in southwest Madagascar, where the community decided to close off this area where there were only four fish per hundred square meters. And after less than a year, there were 334 fish per hundred square meters with the community boasting a large amount of spillover and schooling species that hadn't been that close to shore in years coming close to shore. For the past decade, I've lived in southwest Madagascar among small scale fishers working for Blue Ventures, a marine conservation organization that puts people first. We support coastal fishers in remote and rural communities to rebuild fisheries, restore ocean life, and build lasting pathways to prosperity. Across more than a dozen countries, BV is partnering with traditional fishers and community organizations to design, scale, strengthen, and sustain fisheries management and conservation at the community level. Blue Ventures brings partners together in networks to advocate for reform and share tools and best practices to support fishing communities across the globe. We live and work with fishers in remote areas to meld the rich traditional law knowledge that still exists with scientific knowledge and data, but recognizing that it's not only data that's important, but it's the stories behind the data and the people behind the data and the people who are telling those stories. So we've trained a number of local people to capture those stories and create accessible media that can inspire change. On a much larger scale, we've trained people to collect data on fisheries, to analyze and facilitate discussions around interpreting it. We're working with former fishermen whose traditional knowledge blended with scientific knowledge has provided them with an expertise that has changed the way we work. And these fishermen have passed their training on to others up and down the coast, to many now who boast high level of technical capacity to collect data and guide adaptive management in their own communities. They lead participatory habitat mapping with youth and elders to find out what once was and gather the data to understand what is happening now. The majority of these fishers we've trained don't have high school or middle school diplomas. Yet what they've been able to accomplish and the traditional knowledge and skills that they've been able to blend together has led to something incredible. It's led to this, something that was common for previous generations, but that many youth haven't seen in their lifetime. Subsequently, this has led to somewhat of a revolution up and down the western coast of Madagascar, inspiring other communities to implement the same type of permanent closures to restore ocean life and bring hope back to fishers. Now being able to catch fish close to shore in times of harsh weather and catch schooling species that for decades have only been present in deeper waters. To spread this revolution, we create films and give opportunities to fishers in remote communities to travel to nearby success stories, to talk about their concerns and their efforts to improve their livelihoods and outcomes in the ocean with their peers. Seeing is believing, and these exchanges allow people at the front lines of climate change to see firsthand the successes that others have had in rebuilding fisheries and restoring ocean life. And if you think about why we travel to new places, we do this to see something new, we do this to learn. We often come back completely changed and inspired, refreshed and ready to tackle the challenges that we've left behind back home. And when we get home, we have so many stories to tell, stories that can inspire others, stories that can bring us closer to lost traditions. The exchange itself is a story that we capture on film that can support those who have the ability to change the outcomes for their communities. In this case, a future where fishers and oceans can thrive. So thanks so much for the opportunity to speak 
And uh, I'll end this presentation with a short film that gives my friend and a fisher from the village of Bangulu a chance to tell his story from his perspective. What's better? <clears throat> I would like to thank Paul Antion for this amazing presentation. And uh, the best part of his project, I think, that the community engagement they are learning how to save their traditionals. And they are learning how to, like the data analysis and with the traditional uh, work, they, they are learning and saving. Uh, this is really amazing. Uh, I would like also, because uh, Paul is not here with us, uh, maybe I can ask the, 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 the uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the visitors and our audiences, uh, some questions about the presentation. Uh, may, maybe we, the first question would be, what is the primary, what, what do you think the primary challenges faced uh, Paul Antion in doing his, this amazing project? Uh, do you have any idea of what, what can person face uh, doing like a project with, with some like people don't have these technologies and only that the, the traditional they have? Abdullah, that's a great idea. I would actually request Chuao uh, Silva, if you are still here, because he is representing one of the Ikram's uh, net zero sites from Brazil. Uh, and the question is uh, very interesting. Joao, do you have an answer for us? You're muted, Joao. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um about community engagement in our site in Brazil, we uh, we successfully had a lot of community engagement when talking about, for example, uh, in our case, we, we built uh, a seed bank with the community and uh, they also participated in seed exchange fairs before the construction of the seed bank so they could, uh, so they could uh, choose, they could indicate and collect the species they uh, they use it to grow in their lands it, they, and they no longer had it in, in the territory because of, for example, climate change that made them lost their connection with the land or maybe with the disasters that climate change uh, brought to the land, they lost their, their those varieties of seeds so we have a lot of community engagement while, do, while doing this activity. Since the beginning, it was, uh, uh, we successfully could and happily could too. I think uh, uh, we, we worked very hard, but uh, the odds were in our favor too, because the community is exceptional. Kamburi Kilombola community is an exceptional place. Uh, so even though throughout the, their history, the capitalism system, the climate change, the constructions of, of uh, highways that uh, connected them to the rest of the world, so the um, tourism started to grow in their land, even though all these, um, these changes happened in their land, they still preserved some traditional activities like uh, traditional ways of farming, traditional ways of growing plants like slash and burn or agroforestry or agroforestry backyards. And with their, um, uh, with their help and with their participate, participation, we could build and successfully install the seed banks in the community. Uh, is there anything else that I lost? about the question? No, no, uh, you completely answered the question. Uh, and I, I would like also to ask, um, at, at this part of the world, like Madagascar and uh, the place you are working in, I think, uh, Brazil, uh, did they ha also can do like a, a crowdsourcing? Like people have uh, pictures for uh, 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 traditional activities and you can like collect this from them and revive it? Uh, I, 
I'm sorry, I don't know if I understood. Like, uh, collect pictures and revive yes. some activities that they don't no longer practice. Yes, exactly. Mm. Like a crowdsourcing. Ah, oh yes, yes. Sorry, uh, I misunderstood the English. Uh, uh, that's that's funny because yesterday I asked them about. Um, I don't know how to say in English, but when you print the photos like we did in the past, uh, yes. I asked for printed photos because uh, we have we only have few material historical material of Kamburi, uh because it's a very neglected area. Traditional communities in Brazil they they are passing through um, they are passing through some institutional and governmental changes they are the uh, public policies they are they are uh, achieving now their fight for rights but historically they are very neglected communities so there are few material uh, there are few um, audiovisual material about them we have historical maps about the site, but not about their activity. What we have about their activity is our tradition. It's it's passed through us. Um, it's passed to us through our tradition. Thank you. Um, uh, since uh, anyone other would like to like engage with us with that question, or I will go to the next. Next question. Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, I will give the floor now to Boriana with her speaker to complete the flow. Uh, thank you very much, Abdullah. So our next speaker is Professor Wilfredo Vidal Alangui, who teaches mathematics at the University of the Philippines, Baggio, focusing on the intersection of mathematics, education and culture. He serves as a technical expert for the Indigenization of Science and Mathematics Education Project, collaborating with educators to create context specific lessons. Additionally, he is a member of the Task Force on Indigenous and Local Knowledge for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And his presentation will discuss rice terraces and natural resource management in the Philippines. Whenever you're ready. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Boriana. Um, I, I think I will need to um, um, uh, not turn on my video because my internet is uh, unstable but let me uh, share my screen okay so uh thank you for uh this opportunity to be part of this um, uh, conference. I'm going to talk about uh, the knowledge about uh, water conservation uh, that is found in the rice terracing practice in the um, in Mountain Province uh, in Cordillera Region, Northern Philippines. But let me first uh, pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where I come from. I would like to acknowledge our elders, leaders, and knowledge holders past, present, and emerging. So this is where I come from. Uh, this is the, uh, on the left is the Philippines. Um, we have more than 7,000 islands and uh, 2,000 of these are inhabited. My city, uh, the one with the heart on, on the left uh, of photo um, is Baguio City, which is like five hours away from Manila. Uh, by bus, um, and uh, Baguio City is part of uh, what we call the Cordillera Administrative Region, the one on the right, and uh, CAR is, is home to more than 1.5 million indigenous populations, uh, consisting of at least 15 diverse ethno-linguistic groups. So I would like to uh, tell you where I'm coming from. I'm an indigenous person from the Philippines. A Kankana Ilocano. 
So Kankyanai is one of the 15 ethnolinguistic groups from the Cordillera region. And my inter research interests and advocacies are defined by my identity as an indigenous person, as a mathematician, as a math educator, and activist. Uh, so let me tell you quickly, uh, briefly about the indigenous peoples of the Philippines. There are around 110 ethno-linguistic groups uh, that may be identified as indigenous peoples. That's around 15 to 20 million or 12 to 17 percent of the total number of Filipinos. And um, these indigenous peoples are distributed um, in these different islands in the country. So 33 percent in Luzon, that's where I come from. 6% in the uh, in the Visayas, or this uh, group of islands in the middle of the country, and 61% in Mindanao, or uh, southern Philippines. So this is basically uh, a, a non-exhaustive list of indigenous peoples in the country. So um, this, uh, this uh, listing here would consist of the 33% from Northern Luzon. These ones here are the 6% in the Visayas region. And all these uh, indigenous groups here are from Mindanao in Southern Philippines. So who are the indigenous peoples of the Philippines? Um, these are the populations uh, which inhabited the country at the time of conquest or colonization or at the time of inroads of non-indigenous religions and cultures, or the establishment of present state boundaries. The important thing here is that uh, we have retained some or all of our social, economic, cultural, and political institutions, including our languages. And these uh, peoples have uh, would also include uh, those that have been displaced from their traditional domains, or who may have resettled outside of their ancestral do domain. Um, according to UNDP, then in the Philippines, the indigenous peoples have been subjected to historical discrimination and marginalization from political processes and economic benefit. So we often face uh, exclusion, loss of ancestral lands, displacement, pressures to and destruction of traditional ways of life and practices and loss of identity and culture. And this is happening even as we speak. Uh, in fact, um, even today, our indigenous leaders and environmental and IP advocates continue to be vilified and red tagged by elements of the state. Red tag means that uh, these leaders are either accused of being uh, members of the, com uh, are accused of being communists or terrorists. And uh, red tagging has dangerous consequences as uh, these leaders become targets of killings and disappearances. Uh, for example, um, IP leaders Dexter Capuyan and Jean De Jesus were abducted on April 28, 2023. We have not, been, uh, we have not seen them uh, un until today, and it's going to be a year already next month. And just three days ago, IP advocates uh, Jok Shell Tiong and Francisco Dangla were again were abducted on Sunday, March 24. Um, so we have what we call the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, which is also known as Republic Act 8371, uh, which was enacted in 1997, supposedly to correct historical injustices committed against uh, ind Indigenous peoples and to recognize and protect the rights of uh, IPs. So this has become the cornerstone of national policy on IPs, including the protection of indigenous knowledge systems. But as uh, I've said earlier, uh, effective implementation remains a challenge because we are still subjected to um, uh, a lot of issues. So uh, let me talk about the um, context of our study. Uh, uh, these are the villages of Agawa and Gedai. Uh, so this is the Cordillera Administrative Region on the left, the, the colored areas. And uh, the, the province that I went to is Mountain Province. So it's this one here. And the municipality is Besau. And the villages of Agawa and Gedai are the two red dots in, in this map. Um, this region, uh, the indigenous peoples here are collectively referred to as Igorot. 
Uh, Igorot comes from the root word uh, gulot, meaning mountain chain. Uh, the pre prefix I would mean people of or dwellers in. So therefore, Igorot means people of the mountains or mountain, mountain uh, dwellers. So Iagawa would mean uh, people from Agawa. Uh, and the, Iagawa would also refer to the both the people from Agawa and Gedai. So let me just talk about uh, the Iagawa worldview uh, very quickly. So the Iagawa people continue to adhere to, to a traditional religion. Uh, the key elements of this are, is the, are that uh, water bodies, land formations, rocks, host spirits that protect them from pollution and destruction. Um, we have a belief in the Creator and us uh, and belief uh, belief of ancestral spirits. Uh, ritual pervades the life of the Iagawa, and uh, there are rituals for each stage of the agricultural cycle. Um, the male elders who facilitate the various rituals occupy a respected position in the village. A ritualist may also be a highly skilled stonewaller, as well as an elected political leader in the village. An important principle in this worldview is that every generation has the right to avail itself of the resources offered by the land. And this principle um, dic dictates that um, or ensures that uh, we develop complex strategies and indigenous knowledge systems to sustainably manage and protect our natural resources. And these strategies are expressed in our customary laws and practices. So uh, let me just uh, talk practice in the Cordillera very quickly. So this is situated and maintained in a complex cultural environment. It weaves through the economic, cultural life, political and social organization and cognitive systems of the Cordillera peoples. And this practice integrates technical and agricultural principles with social and cultural knowledge. So in Agawa and Gedai, rice terracing practice is extensive in the area. It's, the, it's a major economic activity and the sloping nature of upland landscapes requires the, the use of soil and water conservation technology, such as stone walling and water management and distribution. Uh, in rice terracing, the associated practice of stone walling is a vital element of the system. It's an example of how people can adapt to and manipulate the environment. And also because of the sloping, uh, because of the um, mountainous terrain in the region, uh, we're also uh, very vulnerable to climate change. Um, as a soil and water conservation technology, a stone wall or kabiti is built to hold the rice paddy, impound water, and in general prevent erosion. Stone walls may also be used to increase the area of the rice paddy or payo. So the goal always is that a stone wall has to be sturdy and stable and uh, should have longevity. And, and uh, because a properly constructed stone wall would allow the farmer to deal with the day-to-day -day demands of rice growing without having to worry about its stability. And uh, especially during the rainy season when the walls become vulnerable to erosion. There's also prestige that comes with the construction of a sturdy, sturdy stone wall. And a good stone waller is acknowledged and respected by the community. Stone walling is highly systematized practice that has persisted for, for hundreds of years in the villages of Agawa and Gedai. Uh, the practitioners have developed skills and knowledge and knowledge in dealing with the materials, classify um, the use of stones, the different kinds of stones, types of soil, and, and other materials, and also in the process of construction. The stonewalling practice assumes symbolic meanings and embodies shared aspirations between the stonewallers and the larger community, as seen in their rituals, beliefs and practices, and myths and stories about stonewalling. So that's the stonewalling uh, practice. Let me talk about uh, a water management and distribution practice in the uh, community, which is also associated with the rice terracing practice. So irrigation is an, is an important aspect of rice cultivation in the region. The presence or absence or lack of water has always been a major consideration 
in the opening of a rice paddy. If no existing water source is available for tapping, they would build a new irrigation. So according to the Iagawa people, all the existing irrigation systems in the villages were built or opened by their ancestors many years ago, and many of these are still being used today. Indigenous ways of water management are governed by certain cultural values and ethics, one of which is the notion that no one has the right to monopolize water. Such an ethic is best captured by, captured by this practice we call binnanes, the indigenous practice of water management and distribution in Agawa and Gedai. Specifically, it refers to a system of water rotation amongst clusters of rice fields during summer when water becomes critical. So binnanes is employed when there is, not, there is not enough water to supply all the rice fields, which normally occurs at the onset of the summer season, uh, which is uh, from March to mid-May. The idea is to have rotation of supply of water, which can be on a daily or weekly basis. basis. And this is resorted to in order to avoid conflicts that may arise between the farmers. So uh, under binnanes, there is a rotational scheme where the elders divide the rice fields into clusters, uh, normally into three clusters, and they agree on a rotational scheme based on the number of uh, rice paddies per cluster, as well as the volume of water. So they would agree on the number of days that will be required to irrigate each cluster. From experience, the farmers say that two days would be enough to cover each cluster rice paddies beyond before the water gets redirected to the next cluster. But if the water is not sufficient, rotation is shortened to one day. So the rotational schedule will depend on the number of clusters. If there are three clusters, there should be one cluster in the morning that gets watered, another in the afternoon, and another cluster in the evening. A person is designated or identified from each cluster to ensure that each rice paddy is irrigated during binanes. The This person oversees the next cluster and cannot divert the water unless every rice field in the previous cluster has been given its share of water. And uh, so this practice would fall under ogbo uh, or collective or cooperative labor, which is uh, prevalent in Cordillera communities. Um, so this practice of binanes uh, is underpinned by this social responsibility, which uh, the community... Uh, would say adim bukudan nan gawis or don't keep the good things to yourself so having water in the payo is a good thing but you're not supposed to monopolize that you need to share it to the other um, owners of rice paddies so this is the overriding principle or ethic it's a social responsibility that every member of the iagawa community is expected to observe however with uh, climate change uh, uh, it, there's danger that um, this uh, practice of stone walling would um, would eventually be um, eroded um, with climate change, uh, whether it's extreme drought or flooding. It would cause regular erosions and landslides, um, including the, the rice terraces. And there's also the emergence of invasive species like earthworms that cause erosion of stone walls. So we have documented these cases of uh, different types of earthworms that are appearing that cause erosion in the stone walls. Um, extreme drought might also, in the long run, force people to abandon the ethic of adim bokudan nangyawis, or the practice of binanes, because there is less and less water to share with everyone. So we are uh, worried that... Uh, Eventually, because of the lack of water, the practice of binanes might no longer be um, practiced by the people. So I think I will end there. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I'm going to ask you a question now, but again, if anyone in the audience wants to jump in and make a comment or ask a question, feel free to type in the chat. Um, how can the valuable indigenous knowledge from these communities be effectively shared and integrated into climate adaptation and conservation strategies, both locally and globally? Um, 
preserving cultural heritage and ecological integrity. I can um, repeat. Yeah. In fact, the practice of stone, the practice of stonewalling, uh, is already being used to um, mitigate the impact of uh, landslides and erosions. So. Um, uh, we, of course, expect that with climate change, there's going to be uh, a growing problem of uh, landslides, especially in our areas. And now stonewalling is being uh, used not only in, in the rice terraces, but also in uh, fortifying roads uh, and also um, um, fortifying buildings and houses. So it's it's also, it's it has, it's being adapted to... Um, to uh, but, um, yeah, to support uh, roads and buildings. Good. So it's very very versatile then. Yeah. Yes. Except that now, um, because in the in 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 the communities they don't use cement, but uh, uh, currently uh, um, the um, engineers uh, would also incorporate the use of cement mm -hmm. to strengthen the stone walls. So it's um I suppose it's sort of a combination between traditional vernacular practices and also yeah. more modern, you know, like cement and things like yes, that. Yes, that's right. Interesting. Um so in terms of how this knowledge is passed down and preserved, um, is there how how do you feel that the idea of preserving this knowledge is uh happening? Um I, I think with stone wall, with stone walling, uh, there's not much of a problem because it has already jump jump application, mm -hmm. and there's growing demand for good stone wallers, mm -hmm. not only in the in the um, provinces but also in the cities or uh, urban centers. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with the uh, the cooperative um, practice of water management, binaness, that might that's something that might uh, be lost. In the future, especially if there's going to be a problem with um, with the availability of water. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is there any questions from the audience, or if anyone wants to jump in? Uh, yes, I see a hand from Mason. If you can just unmute unmute yourself, and you can jump in. Yes, I I want to thank the speaker for the very. Uh inspiring presentation and my question is about the the water management system the bananas and uh, now that of course the lifestyle is changing abruptly with technology and everything um is this indigenous uh very community-based uh management system is it being integrated into some form of let's say formal local administration uh for example is there attempts that the mayor or the governor or the local leaders, the officials, that is, making it more of a an official, you know, uh, system rather than just spontaneous community agreements? Yeah, uh, there is a growing recognition of the importance of uh, of this um, uh, practices, especially because it it's um, it. It's uh, utilizing uh, the community, you know, uh, the, the uh, col collaboration and cooperation among the community members. Uh, and it's not only actually business, but in general, the idea of ug -ug or cooperative labor. Uh, it's still being practiced. The only problem really is that if water becomes uh, scarce, uh, eventually the community might resort to individual uh access to to water instead of uh um utilizing this this idea of uh, of business but there is an effort uh, to document and to even incorporate these uh practices even in the curriculum in basic education for it to be uh codified and institutionalized at least even in the school system Good, thank you. Um, any other questions? Or we can move on to the next speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilfredo. Thank you. Um,
That was an excellent speech. Um, our next speaker will be Joao Paulo Suarez Silva, who is representing the Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action site in Brazil. And he holds a degree in biological sciences from Sao Paulo State University and a master's degree in biosciences, specializing in botany with a focus on floristics and taxonomy of angiosperms. He is currently pursuing a PhD in plant biology at Campinas State University. And Joao collaborates with the Center for Environmental Studies and Research to investigate the impacts of climate change on the natural and cultural heritage of the Quilombola community of Campuri. And his presentation will look at food preservation and traditional farming practices. Whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to, to share my screen. I have a presentation. Uh, it's a very brief presentation with a lot of images. Let me... Uh, just one second. Sorry, I had a, a bad battery problem. <laughs> It's all right, it's all right. Um, can you see my screen? We can, yes. Yes. So, uh, I don't know if it's in full screen presentation. Not, okay. Oh, here, here. Okay, perfect. Okay, you've got it. There you go. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, I'm João, I'm from Brazil. I'm a PhD student at Unicamp and I represent the Brazil team. We work with Camburi Quilombola community in the state of Sao Paulo. And the uh, Quilombos, they were communities of runaway slaves until the abolition of slavery in Brazil in 1888. And those were centers of resistance for slavery people. And currently, this definition is given to the communities of rem remnants of those uh, runaway slaves. So they are considered traditional communities by the federal constitution, and they are a Brazilian cultural heritage. So the Camburi Quilombola community is located in the, uh, in the coast in the north of the state of Sao Paulo, in the city of Ubatuba. And the, the Camburi Quilombo is in an a area of coastal plains and mountainous scarps. Mm -hmm. So the geographic characteristics, they are very di diverse. And uh, uh, it's also a characteristic of Quilombos because Quilombos were established in places where Human, ass assess human assessments weren't possible for, or they were more difficult to be established. So some characteristics of the place, it's located in the Atlantic Rainforest, which is a biosphere reserve of UNESCO because of its species richness of fauna and flora, and also unique species that only exist in this place. The food and genetic diversity of this place is also huge and uh, uh, it's, the, it's the theme of today's presentation, talking about the food preservation and, and the, the agriculture techniques. So uh, they, they also held cultural characteristics. Uh, their cultural heritage includes dance, includes uh, singing, instruments, rituals, festives. Uh, it's, 
they are located in a place with abundance of natural resources like water. And there's a landscape value, a huge landscape value in the area. So it's a very touristic place, isolated and touristic place. They held constructing methods for uh, uh, boats or houses or even uh, instruments. A lot of handicraft techniques and also extractivism techniques. techniques. Artisan of fishing, because they are formed of uh, Quilombola people that were enslaved and Caixara people that are traditional fishers. And talking about uh, today's presentation, they held to knowledge about food conservation techniques, especially when talking about uh, conservation of meat, of fish in general, so using salt in the, in the fish to preserve it. And uh, when, talking about, um, when talking about other ingredients, they, they use, they dry the ingredients to conserve for a longer time, or they, they even can smoke it. Uh, I don't know if it's the right word, but the, to use smokers uh, to, to dry and conserve this food. And they also held a lot of traditional recipes. And talking about the traditional agriculture systems, uh, it was identified that they held three main systems of traditional agriculture. That, that is slash and burn, also known as coivara, where uh, the farmers, they use a space of land for an amount of time, like five, 10 years. And after this period, they leave this piece of land they were using, they leave it to rest and to, uh, to restore its components, and then they they start growing food. They start growing plants in uh, another space. So they clean the space, start planting it. So they slash and burn the area to prepare it for the plantation. And after an amount of years, they change the place again. And in this period, the places where they previous slash and burn it they recover and they are fully restored to be used in a few years. They also held the knowledge to, uh, to do agroforestry activities. That is a, a system where the, the food is grown throughout the forest. So in, uh, in addition with the forest, in this case, the forest is not slashed and burned. So the forest is uh, almost intact. And the, the plants, the, the growing plants for food, they are, they are planted throughout the, throughout the forest without damaging it. And also they have agroforest backyards where the, the, the area is cleaned, usually not burned, but the agroforest backyards, they held other knowledges and um, other culture, culture features that agroforestry, for example, does not present. And I'm going to show you right now. So throughout Cambodia's history in the late 70s, the, there was uh, a, a conservation unit was installed in the area and they prohibited traditional practices such as uh, slash and burn in the area uh, and extractivism too. And the community, they in a, imagining the scenario where they couldn't practice their traditional practice anymore, they started increasingly to be dependent on industrialized resources and products, faced with this impossibility of acting in their traditional and, uh, and traditional and substantial practices. So here, we, we use um, a concept of two uh, French philosophers, Deleuze and Guattari, the concept of rhizome. A rhizome in botany terms, it's, a, a, it's a, a kind of root that connects with other plants of the same, of the same species um, below the earth. So they start 
making connections with each other and they can help each other in terms of uh, nutrients or in terms of, for example, uh, water uh, availability. So it's different from a tree where there is a, um, where there is a, a living species, a living a living being that it's independent and there is that is uh, that has a pivotal a pivotal um, root a rhizome. They are smaller, but they are stronger together. So in this drawing on the on the right of the screen, there is a representation of a rhizome where they are multiple and they are even though they are small, they are strong together. When a plant needs nutrient throughout the rhizome, the nutrients can be transformed to the other plant. So here we present agroforestry backyards as a rhizomatic counter hegemony strategy. So uh, it, as a counter hegemony response to the capitalism system that was, uh, that, that is so harsh in this region. So this agroforest backyard technique is also a form of autonomy and female protagonism because most of the of the people that um, that went out of the community to work were men. So the women stayed at home and they started growing food in their backyards. So the female protagonism is a, a, a main characteristic of this kind of, uh, of agriculture system. And it's observed in different quilombola communities throughout Brazil. So here we can see some uh, news and some articles I'm going to show you very quickly of the power of agroforest backyards, transforming the lives of quilombolas, farmers in other places of the, of the country. Here, showing that this is a form of resistance and knowledge production for peasant and quilombola women. Ah, and again, here in the picture, the, the quilombola woman is used Oh. Okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully you can reconnect. <laughs> so, uh, agroforestry backyard, and here it says that all the women in the quilombo participate in the practice of planting. The plantations operate in the backyards of houses and in the community's gardens. We wow. Produce... Sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Could I just interject? You've your presentation has stopped showing on the screen oh sorry and, and, uh, and the other thing is you've only got one minute left before we have to okay okay it's it's in the end uh are you can you see it again no no oh my god but it's okay it's okay maybe you can just do a, um a quick conclusion and then we can get into the q a Uh, no, I, I'm I'm just uh, going to conclude. Yeah. With my with yeah. my horror abilities. Okay, good. good <laughs> so good. Uh, the in the in the so in the end, this backyard, this rhizomatic backyards, agroforestry backyards, they are powerful tools to the communities, to these traditional communities. They are configured as uh, powerful tools for applying the local ethnobotanical knowledge, aiming not only the food security, but also the climate resilience, as well as other several social, environmental, and collective functions. For example, in the these agroforest backyards, uh, the production and transmission of traditional knowledge and practice there are also exchange of floristic and food diverse diversity with other backyards. It's a space of belonging and territoriality. It's also it also holds an aesthetic and landscape value, natural medicine techniques, and it Hello?
I think your connection is a bit shaky. Um, okay. I think he's gone. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, of, uh, did you hear what I said? Um, a, a part of it, part of it. Um, but I think now we do need to get onto the Q&A and I'm just going to ask you only one question and you've got to make it quick. Um, okay, sorry. How does, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I wish we had more time and that you could finish it uh, in, its, in its true form. Um, but for now, my question to you is, how does the incorporation of traditional knowledge from the Quilombola communities complement modern approaches to environmental conservation and food security? So again, the idea of this blend of vernacular craft practices and knowledge mixing into what we can actually tangibly do with it in our modern modern way. Um, the 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 mixing of the traditional the traditional practice with. Uh, uh, with future and technological health practice, I think the, the most important of it is the diversity of species of knowledge and uh, of, um, of uh, also the, the, the diversity of people that practice it. So using the Quilombola knowledges, for example, uh, we, we will not use monoculture system. So I think there are there are uh, a space of dialogue to do, but there's some some things that they are not dialogable. I don't I don't know if this this uh, word exists, but uh, for example, the diversity is the main key of a backyard of agroforestry backyard. So using the diversity of forms in a in a backyard, a traditional quilombola backyard, we can use it to to uh, strengthen a traditional, uh, a non-traditional way of growing plants. But uh, even we need to respect the diversity in first place so we can move on. I think the diversity is the key. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, if you have any other questions for Joel, please put them in the chat and I'm sure he'll answer them later on. Uh, on to you, Abdullah, you can introduce your speaker now. I would like to thank you, Boriana, and the speaker for speakers for their presentation. And now for our next presenter and speaker, uh, I am delighted to introduce Ripaul Kanji, an architect with a unique connection to traditional living and sustainable sustainability practices, residing residing in a traditional house in Judapur. Ripaul, the the floor is yours. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Let me just share my screen and I will be very quick in my presentation. I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's, uh, it's a beauty. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, as you introduced me correctly, I am going to talk about things in Jodhpur, which is a city in uh, India. To briefly tell you about Jodhpur, Jodhpur it is a huge tourist destination with palaces, forts, and magnificent temples. The problem with Jodhpur is perhaps the geographical location of it. It is just bordering the desert uh, in, in India, the Thar Desert, and hence the climate by default is hot and arid. And due to this, there are compounding risk of cyclic droughts, extreme heat, and building water stress. The impacts of climate change have long been distant to the communities here, but now they have started to feel it. So like any other Indian city, or perhaps uh, it would be wrong to say Indian city, but th this is something that is being done all over the world. Uh, heat action plans are being prepared in many cities. So in Jodhpur, what has happened is uh, something uh, unique has happened that the heat action plan, which is basically a policy document, uh, it has mainstreamed traditional knowledge, indigenous practices and place based wisdom into the heat, heat action plan. So uh, what makes it very interesting is that the government, the local government rather, 
that their own traditional knowledge, their indigenous practices, their place-based wisdoms are to be used for battling the rising heat and the rising humidity, which is a great concern to the community there. Uh, so this this is this is the context within which we we were working in Jodhpur. So I would just quickly run you through some of our interventions. Uh, when the heat action plan was launched and it opened up an avenue to introduce traditional knowledge and indigenous practices, we thought, why not go out into the communities and talk to the people and collect information, collect their perception, collect their opinions about what they think about climate change and how they have always been battling the rising heat, the, the problems of humidity. So we met a lot of people uh, around hundreds or actually more of them, but we selected a few of them who, who stood out to be incredibly uh, perceptive of the issue. Uh, one of them was a very young politician, a ward counselor, a grandmother living with three generations of families in, in a very, very old house, as, as old as 600 or 700 years old house, a sweet shop owner who runs his shop for over 90 years, and they have seen the weather change, they have seen the climate change, and, and a rickshaw, which is, which is a very uh, indigenous vehicle in India that we use, uh, they are at the forefront of the impacts and effects of climate change. So we we spoke to all of them, we collected their opinion, their, their understandings, and then we compiled all of this together uh, in, in, in a documentary. In addition to the discussions that we had with different people in the community, we also made it a point to talk to the women. Women, in general, they are regarded as the vulnerable section with, with uh, disproportionate effects and impacts on them because of climate change. But we, when we talked to them, when we spoke to them, we found out that they are the ones who are basically leading the battle at the household level, at the very, very high local levels. So uh, they, they, they have those kind of knowledges, they have those kind of wisdom about practices which are actually used. Let there be the heat action plan or not, doesn't matter. They, with the knowledge passed down through the generations, they are the ones who are leading the battle. In fact, we also made it a point to talk to the kids, ranging from four year old to 21 years of age. And, and to them, the understanding of climate change, disasters, conflicts, or anything of that sort is really vague. They do not understand uh, the signs behind uh, important for us to realize is that they do understand that changes are taking place. For example, a little girl very uh, wittily pointed out that today we enjoy tea and fritter, which is a very common thing to do in India when it rains outside. But five years from now, because of the changes in in in, in the climate, the, the the weather patterns, this might not be the thing. So this this practice of enjoying tea and fritters with, with the family, with your grandmother, with your mother will just not be there. It will be a distant memory to all of them. So all of this put together, we we compiled it into a documentary, which we call the Climate Culture Story of Jodhpur, which is available on YouTube. And we feel that it is a very novel way of communicating the riskscape of the city in the words through the narratives of the people living in the city, which inspires them to kind of take an action to do something about it. So this was one very important thing. The second thing about Jodhpur is that since Jodhpur is located in a geoclimatic zone where heat has always been a problem, the traditional houses stood out to be something very interesting. For example, that the folklore is that the houses are colored blue and because of this blue color, uh, that the houses are cooler when you go inside. Now, being being uh, from a science scientific background, this this is a little bit difficult for us to you know believe in the first go. So we we designed a prototype which is a digital humidity and temperature tracker, and we use that de device to kind of understand whether the temperature and the humidity actually goes down when you go inside the building. And we found out it really does. But is it because of the blue color? Well, we did an elaborate study, an architectural study, and we found out, no, it's, it's of course, not the blue color, but it, it is because of how the houses have been constructed. I will show you a small video of how, how the whole...
I'm pausing the video right here. So this is, this is a very small uh, animation of a very elongated video. And this kind of explains how the buildings were built way back 200 or 300 years ago. Uh, the way they were ventilated, the way air circulation happened within it, it actually maintained a very, very ambient indoor temperature as compared to the outside soaring temperature. So what we have done is we, we conducted this architectural study and we have prepared this report and this report is submitted to the corporation, which is the urban local government. And it is upon them now to take it forward and incorporate these changes in the master development plan. Now, moving on to the last important thing, see, as I mentioned, because Jodhpur is bordering the, the Thar Desert, water has always been a problem for the city and and the kings once uh, uh and the queens basically they 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 made it a point to kind of conserve water now water con uh, water conservation or rainwater harvesting the maximum level at which we can think of is at the level of a building or at the level of let's say one reservoir but but this this is enormous and the rainwater is collected in multiple water bodies of different shapes in different forms and they are architecturally wonderful but what has happened over the years is that the dependence on these kind of water bodies has gone down because of pipe water supply to the city so this has created a new problem of rising groundwater which leads to uh urban flash floods and those kind of things so we wanted to do something about it but but uh, of course, we were we 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 did not have the resource to do everything. So what we thought was that we should be able to kind of empower the next generation to understand the importance of these water bodies to understand the intersection of these water bodies disaster risk reduction acted three or four schools in jodhpur and and empowered these these children who showed interest and the teachers uh, through a four day long workshop and to be and, and they feel that these are actually ways in which they can uh, bring about a very very risk informed sustainable development so this was the entire scope of work that we under the framework of net zero uh, did in jodhpur so we have this climate culture story i would request most of you to please come and see this video this, this is this would be a very novel thing that you would watch understanding the climate and the culture of a place through the narratives of the community uh, we have the the recommendations, the reports that I, I was talking about, they are also available on the on 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 the internet tube, and we are trying our best to disseminate this as, as governments, national governments, with, with at international forums. So this has been our journey, and uh, this this is what I was willing to talk to you all about. Thank you for listening to me, and I'm open to questions. Thank you again. Thank you, Ripaul. Thank you for your uh, great uh, presentation. I would like to ask you just one question because our time is running. Uh, so uh, how can traditional and modern architectural practices be merged to create sustainability, sustainable building homes that appeal to the public in 2024? And what strategies could effectively pursue individuals to adopt such a lifestyle change? Right. Uh, thank you for this interesting question. Uh, in fact, this is something that we were trying to do in Jodhpur. I would say the first thing is that uh, people of this generation, they, they need to realize that there are certain things, there are certain elements from the past which are which are actually very useful when you talk about climate action in this, this era. So that is something that is important. This needs to be done. And we as people who understand this, it, it the responsibility is kind of upon us to spread the message that this is important. So this is one. The second is to kind of uh, lay down examples or build examples. For example, uh, we, we have met many new modern day architects who have started combining the old architectural elements with contemporary buildings and they have found out that they are operating magnificently. They, they are climate intelligent buildings, they are energy efficient buildings and they're doing well. It is just that these 
examples which have been which have been established they need to be taken forward and some sort of uh, push from the government or from the from the local administrators are required and i i feel it's just a matter of some years some days when when this this becomes a a movement kind of a thing and people start taking this up so yes uh, bits and pieces there are examples happening but yeah a, a, a whole lot of effort is of course required to bring it all of it together thank you ripaul uh, now i will give the floor to mona if there is no questions from the audiences Thank you so much, Abdullah. Uh, I think uh, we have a question in the chat, I see, and uh, maybe all our presenters can take up this question. Uh, we are running a bit late, but uh, let's take five minutes to you know, answer this question and wrap up. So it's, the question is coming from Helen. Uh, she's saying, thank you for the very interesting presentation uh, and a very good question from Mehsoon. Uh, what she's asking is that, uh, is very interested in this issue of competing management systems and how to resolve conflicts between formal and informal management to allow indigenous or local knowledge systems to continue to be supported. Interested to hear if anyone has any solutions. And uh, if uh, Helen, if you would like to also, you know, just turn off, turn on your microphone and explain the question, please go ahead. So over to the presenters. Uh, Ripoll or um, Joao uh, or our other presenters, Willy, I don't know if you have, uh, if you're still on board on in the meeting, if you would like to take up the question. Uh, maybe I, I will go first. Uh, go I, I have a meeting to attend, so I will, I will just go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. answer the question and yeah. Uh, so uh, this is something that we faced in Jodhpur as well. And uh, we were the ones, our team in Jodhpur, we were the ones who wanted to kind of mainstream traditional knowledge uh, into the development practices, into, into policies, into whatnot. And uh, we found a, a, a lot of difficulties, actually, to kind of convince people that these are the things, these are evidences from the past which can actually be integrated. So... Uh, that is why we, we started doing scientific studies and building up evidences. So when people say that the old houses in Jodhpur have or provide an ambient indoor temperature, we, we said that, yes, it, it does. But then we built a prototype. We investigated the entire thing. We brought in architects. We did a good study and we published the report and we shared it with them. So now they... It's it's like it's it's upon them to understand that these are actually evidence based solutions which they need to integrate now because because uh, that there's no way that climate change is going to halt anytime soon it, it's going to happen and it is going to be graver than we can even imagine so there, these are elements from the past these are evidences from the past which you can integrate so this was one thing that we did we did we we produced evidences and the second thing is that. Uh, we were lucky in this in this case is that uh, although generation after generation the lifestyle the ways of life of people in Jodhpur has changed, but Jodhpur even now informally has uh, a monarchy. So there is a king there, and and the king with his family, with all his trusts and with all his organizations, they are kind of the guardian of of the culture in Jodhpur. So we found them to be very interested in our interventions and, and we reached out to them and they started to act like a bridge between us and, and the local government. And many of our recommendations are right now being put to use. So I, I would say in the second, in the second example, we, 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 had, we were just lucky to find someone who, who was there to help us out. Maybe it would not be the case in other, uh, in other sites, but yes. There would be some organization, someone in an influential position who could actually be that bridge that we are looking for. So this this was my uh, experience from Jodhpur. Thank you, Ripal. Thank you so much. And uh, I also see Wilfredo, Mr. Wilfredo, if you would like to add to this. Yeah, I think um, it's also um, important to realize that even at the international level, for example, at the IPBES or IPCC, there's growing recognition of the importance of indigenous and local knowledge. And 
the fact that we are now um there's there's effort to really consider uh, ILK in these processes will also help at the national level in in the recognition of the importance of this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope, uh, Helen, you have your answer. Uh, and uh, I think with that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the discussants, Boriana and Abdullah, for uh, beautifully, uh, you know, being the discussants and beautifully curating this session and uh, bringing out so many stories from around the world. And for this very engaging discussion, I would like to thank all our attendees. And a special, special thanks to the four presenters for sharing your work. You are doing such amazing work. And Wilfred, I we see you. Thank you for turning on your camera. Uh, and, uh, you know, the work that you're doing is fantastic and how you're engaging communities for uh, managing and conserving uh, the heritage sites in the face of climate change. I think that's like, that's the key and that's the way forward. So. Thank you so much once again for joining. We would really uh, like for you to stay on for the next stream, uh, which we will start in five minutes. Uh, and that will focus on indigenous and uh, community health knowledge on disaster uh, preparedness and response. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second stream of our last panel of this conference uh, under the talking tree. The second stream will focus on indigenous and traditional wisdom for disaster preparedness and response. And I'm very happy to introduce our next three discussants uh, who will moderate the presentations that are lined up for the stream. So I'm happy to introduce you to John Carl, who is a program officer for the SDGs in uh, Ateneo de Manila University for the Institute of Sustainability. Um, Kenta Sayama, who is a PhD student in natural resource management at Oxford University. And then Valentina Poveda, who is a master's student in international cooperation on human rights and intercultural heritage at the University of Bologna. So welcome, I'm sure you will do a great job and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Zoe for the kind introduction. Um, good afternoon. Um, we will be uh, mon sorry moderating this uh, session and the schedule of our session. We will just have the four presentations from uh, the case studies that 
uh, come from uh, around the world, then we will give um, we will be asking some questions to the indigenous knowledge uh, bearers um, first, and we will then open the floor uh, to all the participants for um, to ask questions to the researchers as well as the uh, knowledge bearers. And in the very end, we will ask a final question to um, the knowledge bearers and conclude our session. Um, because we do not have too much time, I will start and um, welcome our <clears throat> uh, participants from Sudan. Um, we from Sudan. We have Miss Esra Osman uh, Mohammed Abdullah El Gadi and Miss Inas uh, Mohtal Ali. Um, Esra. Um, will jointly represent Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action Innovation Site in Sudan. She is an architect and project management professional with over 13 years of experience in the field of consulting, design, and project management. She is also an active volunteer in DRR initiatives in Sudan. And Inas um, is also from the Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action Innovation Site in Sudan. And she has experience in uh, various top uh, various projects, including the Hot Project, which was a project led on the Taya analysis and Taya based uh, flood mitigation framework, which she will explain to you in shortly. And she has worked in Idea Map Sudan, um, which is an open geo database for mapping uh, deprivation in Khartoum to support evidence based decision making and urban policies. Also, she has been uh, leading project management of Nufik Portfolio Sudan. Um, they will be joined by a Taya knowledge bearer to participate in this discussion. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello, John. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Uh... Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction and I'm happy to be presenting on behalf of Sudan team, the Heart Project Heritage Forward Action for Risk in Duty Islands. Uh, the project was implemented in leadership uh, by Sudan Urban Development Think Tank organization and in collaboration with this uh, second, because uh, the slides are not moving. So the project was implemented, uh, led by the Sudan Urban Development Think Tank Organization uh, in partnership with, with the University of Khartoum and the Sudan Sudanese Social Enterprise Studio Urban. Uh, our project is located in Tutti Island, which is uh, located in the heart of Khartoum, uh, the capital of Sudan, surrounded completely by, by uh, water. And it's unique location because it's um, at the confluence of the two Niles, the Blue Nile and the White Nile, marking the start of the Nile towards the north. Tuti Island is not unique only because of its location, but also because of its history and community. It's one of the oldest communities in uh, Khartoum, uh, and they have strong community relations. They have pride of their land island. Um, Tuti community is known for their solidarity, and they act like uh, one family. Over the years, they developed strong knowledge and practices related to the Nile. Because they lived by the Nile for ages and for centuries, uh, their livelihood, their heart are, 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 are related to the Nile, their livelihood and sources of living, and also they've developed lots of different cultural traditions and practices uh, associated to the Nile. And they learned how to adapt and to respond to its risk as well. So they developed traditional weather forecasting and mechanisms to reading the Nile, for reading the Nile. Uh, this mechanism is basically called, known as a uh, TAYA. The TAYA, it's uh, the Flood Mitigation Heritage in Tutti. Um, uh, the nice thing that in 2015, they were recognized as champions of disaster risk reduction by the U uh, UNDRR uh, because of their traditional system of flood warnings, uh, which have ensured little or uh, no loss of lives uh, during uh, uh, major flood events in Tutti. 
looking into 2T and climate, uh, climate uh, risks in 2T, our team developed uh, this risk matrix and they looked, uh, tried to identify the climatic risks that threatened the, uh, the, uh, uh, the islands. Uh, they were able to identify key four primary hazards, erosion, river folding, heavy rains, and extreme years. And they looked into the risks associate, associated with these hazards. Uh, what are the road causes, the vulnerabilities and amplifiers? Uh, what are the effects and also who is uh, exposed to, the, to these risks? Um, in this map, uh, this is like the main hazards or risks that uh, uh, threat Tuti Island. We have the floods which the climate projection suggests that the intensity and the frequency of floods will increase and change, and also the erosion process and the alluvial uh, depositions, uh, which result in losing parts of the land and uh, 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 impose risks and hazards also on people's lives and uh, livelihoods. Um, all these risks uh, uh, also is associated with, uh, for and reasons for losing uh, the heritage, the uh, losing the local knowledge and the traditional practice, which has been passed through generations uh, 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 in Tuti Island. So, uh, looking into this diagram, we have main identified five main reasons for losing the heritage: urbanization and the rapid urbanization uh, expansion in Tuti Island, which started almost in 20, 2010. Uh, 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 because of the bridge, Tuti Island uh, was isolated in, uh, yani for long centuries, was isolated because it wasn't linked to the mainland, to Khartoum city, only in 2010, where a uh, bridge was constructed. And then uh, the rapid uh, urbanization expansion uh, started in Tuti. And also people started to build in more vulnerable areas. Um, and it was witnessed a huge socioeconomic change and changes in, in land use, and also it res result uh, into gentrification. And um, people also started to uh, move out of Tuti, and also all uh, newcomers used to come to live in Tuti. Um, Tuti, the new generations in Tuti also. Uh, uh, started to leave uh, to leave Tuti looking for uh, different job opportunities for education and for a different lifestyle outside of the island and um, um, another reason is also uh, leaving the island for uh, looking for better so, uh, economic uh, uh, and livelihoods different that the, the ones associated or uh, existing in the in the island so they became Less, less connected to the Nile and less observant to the Nile. And this change in, in the lifestyle also uh, 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 brought disconnection between generations. Another environmental reason is also the river erosion, uh, which affect parts of the, uh, part of the, uh, uh, of the island and cause loss of a uh, lot of lands and many farmers and knowledge bearers, they lost their livelihoods, uh, livelihoods uh, uh, because of that. Um, also, uh, the armed conflict, conflict, the recent armed conflict with, which broke out in Sudan, in Khartoum, uh, in April last uh, year, is um, a major reason that limits the preparedness uh, of the community and also uh, um, forcing people to flee outside of the island. All these are considered reasons for losing the heritage of Ataya. So Ataya is an urban resilience story. It started sin since 1946. This when it has been documented uh, when the ta Tawatas, uh, the Taya residents, uh, uh, protected their island with their bodies, and they started to uh, start the Taya system by uh, creating a lookup point to monitor the flood. It was uh, basically a tent. Uh, started as a tent that will be erected in the flood prone areas. Uh, uh, if you look to the map in the left side of the slide, this is the locations of the TIA system, which uh, identified by our team last year. Uh, so they put these um, tents in uh, the flood prone areas uh, for them to be able to see and to observe the Nile and the flood. And not only that, but it's also points for a meeting and management uh, that the, the community and the flood committee use uh, to organize themselves and uh, also for logistics. Uh, 
um, each TIA would have a team where all community members also support the, the TIA to sustain its work. Its work. This uh, collective action is uh, supported by strong indigenous governance. So the TIA is a community-led food risk management system. It's deeply integrated with the Tuti community. As we can see here in, uh, in the diagram, uh, they have uh, formed a local, uh, local communities uh, called Tuti uh, Community for Flood Mitigation, uh, a committee, sorry, for flood mitigation which is responsible for organizing and coordinating all the, effort, all the efforts for uh, flood mitigation. Uh, the committee is even uh, recognized by the authorities and uh, it, uh, it coordinates between, within Tuti community and also with other stakeholders outside the Tuti community which sub who supports the efforts of Tuti community to respond to the flood risks. So uh, all the uh, uh, inside Tuti, all local organizations and societies, they participate in, uh, in uh, responding to the risks. All community groups, males, females, youth, children, they all uh, 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 are aware and participate in the flood mitigation efforts. Another uh, key uh, aspect is the indigenous forecasting that they used uh, to predict the floods. They start monitoring the Nile uh, in early stages in the flood season. They look uh, uh, to changes in the river by looking into the, uh, into the water color, uh, the sand sed sediments. They can tell where the rain has fallen and uh, predict uh, the flood uh, by looking into these indicators, also the, the types of fish in the river. Also, the changes in the weather, they can look into the sky, uh, to the uh, different types of clouds, its color, the wind direction, and uh, the sandstorms. Each, uh, each feature of the weather and the changing in the weather, weather, they can predict and anticipate the start or the end of the flood season and uh, prepare for it. And also the yes. appearance. You yes. have one minute left. Oh, they will go very fast. The appearance of certain plants uh, and animals, they also have a local seasonal calendar um, uh, that they use. And they use several uh, forms uh, of sources for monitoring and uh, early warning, uh, using the TAIA as a local points, uh, also using the indigenous knowledge uh, which uh, and indigenous bureaus like the farmers and fishermen in observing the Nile and also communicating with the other communities and coordinating official bodies about the reading of the Nile. Uh, having all these uh, data and sources of warnings, then uh, the Tawatas are able to uh, predict the flood and monitor the flood early. And when there is any uh, uh, imminent uh, flood is coming, they will start to uh, the early warning to the community through mosques. And the community are aware and they uh, uh, you know the different messages and they act accordingly and they uh, head to the uh, uh, area of the uh, risk to protect the, their island and the people from the floods. So we work to, uh, we aim to have like four outcomes of our work to document, strength and transfer and integrate this uh, heritage. And we looked into it as a system where we have uh, key three players, the flood committee, the tires and the Tutti community. Uh, uh, we were able to identify 10 steps that they work around before, during, and after flood, uh, before the flood, or they were uh, the tires uh, 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 focus on observing the Nile, the flood committee work in the planning and preparation, the community are aware and engaged and uh, participate in sustaining the tire work. During the flood, uh, all the community and flood committee will act to respond to the risk, and after the flood, they also work on uh, monitoring the, uh, the seeding of the river flood and also coordination of the recovery of efforts. And uh, the community work collectively to uh, uh, on the recovery actions, also related to the health problems uh, 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 and the vulnerable groups to uh, aid them. We were able to, uh, when we study the, the, these eight steps of the TIA, we were able to align them with the disaster risk reduction phases, uh, the four phases of preparation, response, recovery, and mitigation. And um, to be able to transfer this model into other uh, communities, we think that 2D has uh, uh, ages of uh, heritage of this practice, and so they know their environment and they built uh, 
a very strong community engagement and risk awareness. But this is this is need need to be uh, yani, developed in any new community who is trying to uh, adopt the Thai based model. So uh, to transfer this, uh, uh, when we worked into a uh, uh, framework to transfer this Thai system to other communities, uh, we added two steps. So uh, uh, suggesting ten steps for uh, uh, based on the Thai practice and. Um, all this we accumulate this in um, a guideline. It's uh, uh, it, uh, including lesson learned from the Taya, uh, aiming for uh, community members and also for for similar communities who want to, uh, who are prone to similar risks, and also to transfer this knowledge for to the uh, new generations. And what we think made that made uh, Taya is a, a successful. Uh, uh, I will I will finish in shortly. Uh, uh, what made Taya uh, successful? We think it's because it's very integrated within the society society fabric. It's integrated uh, uh, with also the local community agencies and related related government system. They have uh, built with them very strong partnerships, and also the high community resilience and awareness about their risks and their vulnerabilities, and the use of multiple resources are, as I just explained and also the, their ability to prioritize and support disadvantages and vulnerable groups during and after the flood and the risk seasons. Uh, finally, the TAIA um, yani, um, uh, proved to be a flexible and adaptable system that the Tawat is now, after the, the conflict uh, which broke out last year and which uh, during the conflict, the, the island is completely isolated and uh, all the supplies of food, water, uh, medicine is uh, disrupted. So using the same community action and the same tire uh, uh, concept, but only changing the locations of the tire because of security reasons or to make it more convenient with, within the, the new situation, they also use the same uh, community action to uh, provide uh, food, <laughs> meals, and uh, water supplies to the different neighborhoods in Tuti and also to work on the maintenance of the water and so um, it, this community-based, uh, community-led uh, mit uh, flood mitigation heritage uh, proved to be um, um, uh, livable, adaptable, and could support communities in different circumstances rather than uh, uh, risk related to climate. Uh, with that, I conclude, and sorry for being over time. Thank you, John. Oh. All right. Uh, thank you so much um, for that very insightful presentation. So um, I'm Carl from the Philippines, and uh, I would like to open the floor now for questions from the audience. So um, feel free to send your questions through the chat box or through um, or Maybe you can raise your hand. All right. I think uh, because uh, we have um, we have some uh, time constraints, we will uh, we will put all the questions later on at the uh, the later part of all the sessions. Or, I mean the presentations. So I would like to proceed now to um, the next presenter, and um, like to present um, Amira Sadiq Ali El Sayed. Um, she's currently the executive manager for the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation. So she will represent the Net Zero um, Heritage for Climate Action Innovation Site in Egypt. And she holds a Bachelor of Archaeology and a high, uh, high Diploma of History of Art and Greco-Roman um, from Faculty of Archaeology, uh, Cairo University, and also a Professional Diploma in Translation from the University uh, of Lyon, Lumia, uh, and also a specialized diploma yeah, in politics and civilization from the University of Sorbonne in no, Paris. No, 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 no. Um, she, she's also working at, in documenting tangible and intangible heritage since 2005, and she organizes workshops for public and uh, public specialists and creating a sociocultural program for children and youth to disseminate knowledge related to heritage. From the Egypt side, um, there will be a Sheikh 
uh, from the fisherman sector and a community member from Borg Rashid to participate in the discussions. I would like to give the floor now to Amira. Thank you for thank you so much for your uh, for your for this lovely interpretation. I'm sorry to be to be so long for it, and uh, I will not be I will not present a long presentation, but it will be related to the indigenous and local knowledge, uh, especially coming from uh, Borg Rashid. The key is a one of the net zero project that has been and one of the net zero innovation at Egypt. And uh, where we have present before on the first uh, uh, th on the first uh, day of our conference related to um, how these indigenous people in Borg Rashid uh, are working in the two uh, of the main uh, um, uh, two of the main activities uh, of the population there since six thousand years ago, which were the cultivation and the fishing. And uh, uh, in our uh, in 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 our work with this community, uh, we were just looking what is the local knowledge that has been transferred from this old time till now, and uh, how we can uh, bring this knowledge to uh, a new level, which will be um, uh, which will be uh, lacking a kind of mitigated the risk of climate change. And uh, this is, was obviously uh, um, uh, uh, this is, was one of the main things that uh, lead us to make the early warning system, depending on the um, the knowledge that they have uh, from the, their local knowledge. Uh, what I am talking about is uh, especially in the ancient. If we coming back to the ancient Egyptian civilization. We have uh, we have uh, people who are living in this place, looking to the looking to the sky with a very good uh, observation, and in the same time looking to their location, which is the, the Nile uh, the Nile River that you can see it here, uh, the map of the Nile River, because Rosetta is just located at the end of this Nile River meeting the Mediterranean Sea. From this, from their observation for the sky and for the Nile flood cycle, they realize that there is a connection between what is happening in the, uh, what is happening in the astronomy and the, the, what is happening in the meteorology and what is happening and they reflect on it on the, on their uh, land. And uh, this is, has a, a very, uh, has created from this early, uh, time a kind of calendar which was created even 3000 uh, pc and you can see that this calendar was uh, uh, was already uh, bringing uh, the year to 3 uh, to 3065 year and at the same time uh, they have already uh, make it, it to 12 to uh, three uh, season, the season of flood and the season of uh, which took about four months of the year and the season of cultivation, which you can see it uh, another four months of, of the year and the season of the uh, harvest, with this, which is another four months of the year, which make the year and the calendar already 12 months. They have noted that uh, the, har the that the flood of the Nile at the same time happened when the Cyrus star uh, uh, just shining for the first time in the sky, and this is, was related to the beginning of the inundation uh, of the Nile. Even how all the the indigenous in Egypt. Are are saying that this is the this is the Nile of the first uh, drop of water, and they brought this this uh, special day at the beginning of their calendar, and from uh, and from here they have uh, are making a lot of notification related to the weather and what is happening to the weather. The, even the, that we have like seven years of uh, good flood, which is uh, which is the El Nina years, and we have seven years of bad flood, which is El Nino years. And this is why they they all they always um, 
highlighted that we have a very high risk of a, a famine that could happen due to the scarcity of corpses uh, in the seven years of El Nina. So how they have making a kind of uh, mitigation through uh, through conserving the corpse in the seven good uh, years uh, where we have a very good uh, floods to be using in the seven bad years of inundation. And from here, the, uh, and from this calendar also, the, this calendar till now is still working in Egypt, especially in this uh, indigenous part. And, uh, and even we have still the Coptic uh, ancient Egyptian name of the, of the Mansus, uh, and uh, and uh, even all the cultivators in Rashid uh, and even the fishermen have note on this kind of of, uh, of calendar the uh, the storms that they know. For example, in the seven years of El Nino, they know that they have a high storm related to heat waves and related to uh, a kind of a. Uh, 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 sandstorm leaves. And uh, what we are doing in our uh, early warning system that we are brooding for them or the meteorological uh, prediction um, uh, uh, that we uh, that already can be uh, that we can get uh, with its IPs from the windy uh, uh, from the windy uh, website for meteorological. And in the same time, making connection between it and between the ancient Egyptian calendar and the Coptic one, and we embedded in it all the uh, all the traditional knowledge related to uh, plantation uh, level of water, and even related to the storms they know by the name that is it is known uh, in this indigenous uh, indigenous uh, communities. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was really interesting to learn about the Coptic calendar in ancient Egypt. Um, that is a knowledge that's very useful even for today. Um, <clears throat> we will ask you questions later, so we will move on to the next presentation for now. Um, next up, we have a presentation from Uganda. And we have Mr. Frederick uh, Nsibambi, uh, who is the Deputy Executive Director uh, of the Cross-Cultural Foundation of Uganda. Um, he will be representing the Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action Innovation Site in Uganda. Uh, he possesses an MA in Economics and Administration of Cultural Heritage, and he plays a supervisory and support role in strategy development, institutional leadership, pro program design, and implementation, especially for heritage conservation projects. He will be the lead person during the project implementation. Um, the Without further ado, the floor is yours, Mr. Frederick. Sorry, it's me, Ali Guma. I will present uh, my colleague Frederick is unable to be here. So I'll go direct to my presentation. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah. So my name is Ali Guma Havion, and I work at the Cross Culture Foundation of Uganda. And uh, I'll start with a short video. Are you able to see my screen? So you're not in presentation mode. Um, could you make your uh, presentation full screen? Yes, that looks great. Thank you very much.
Ops. Oke. Okay. Okay, so that is uh, that's the video I thought I would play, and welcome to the presentation. So I present about Kororo Falls. Kororo Falls is found in Kasese. Kasese is a district uh, that is uh, around, it surrounds the Renzori Mountains National Park, which is a heritage site. And this is the Exarcha Kororo Sacred Site. Um, just briefly about the site, uh, the site is, a, a conf is located at the confluence of Kaviri and Kitengesa rivers in Tundo sub-county. So there are two rivers. The Wakonzo community, which is in Kasese, uh, river, rivers, or they, they hold rivers in high, in high regard because they, they have spirits like you might have seen in the videos. And uh, uh, so rivers are respected, but of course with the effects of climate change, uh, things are happening. But also there are other indigenous communities around the site. Um, okay, sorry. So the Wakonzo also have totems. And that's myself there at uh, one of the engagements with young people uh, talking about the totems of the Wakonzo. They are chimpanzees, uh, totems that live in forests, uh, in water bodies, and generally uh, uh, in the environment. So they are threats to the heritage and uh, local communities that are orchestrated by climate change. You might have seen in the videos, uh, the Ruenzori, which is the area, or the Ruenzori Mountains, derives its name from the, uh, the snow, Ruenzururu, which means the snow. But uh, World Bank, UN, the IUCN reports show that by 2040, 2050, there will be no snow on the mountains. And of course, that has a lot of impact in increasing the volume of waters in the rivers that flow from the from the mountain, so uh, floods are increasing and there's a sharp um, uh, inc increment in, in terms of the, uh, the deterioration of the snow, like you, might have, like you might see there in the first graph, but also the anticipation of uh, heavy rainfalls, which will definitely have impact on the heritage of the people, on the livelihoods and the housing, uh, one of the photos on the right, I just took this photo uh, two weeks ago, showing how boulders coming from the mountains have uh, widened the banks of the rivers. Uh, there is a photo by New Vision on the left, uh, Red Cross give, trying to come in for rescue uh, because of the landslides, um, destroying people's houses. But we tried to collect indigenous knowledge that could support uh, the climate action in this area, and uh, there's this publication which you can find online. So they are community-based warning systems, like foretelling, of course. Um, uh, there are gods that are helpful in pre predicting uh, weather conditions. And some of these gods, like you would read in the publication or in the video, reside in the rivers. So it's important to preserve the rivers because there are gods that will help in uh, mitigating against climate change. And some of, of course, some of this knowledge is still existing, and uh, the elders, of course, have a role to pass it to the young generation, and we've documented this. There are traditional governance systems. Uh, the Ruenzori Mountains, it's called the mountains because there are many ridges. So each ridge has a, uh, a leader, a ridge leader. The, the issue here is that they are not so much incorporated in the... Uh, in the modern, what you would call modern um, climate action uh, uh, systems. Of course, there are indigenous trees that support river catchment and traditional worship, uh, associated taboos and ritual cleansing ceremonies. So the, a lot of knowledge really was gathered and would support our climate action. Um, so this perpetual planting of trees, 
from the knowledge that was uh, gathered uh, from uh, uh, this work supported by ICROM on the Net Zero a Heritage for Climate Action Project, uh, bamboo trees have been planted. Uh, the mainstreaming uh, community-driven early warning systems uh, in modern uh, systems. There is an event we had, this is it here, uh, in Kasese town. Because some of these people are reluctant to even go to uh, the rivers uh, that are uh, that uh, the communities hold there. So we try to bring uh, the stakeholders in spaces that they like, uh, spaces like hotels, say, okay, this is happening. Um, the person speaking there is uh, responsible for disaster uh, risk uh, reduction and management at a national level. Of course, you can see it was even a problem getting this person to go to the ground, but he was interested at least in giving presentations and hearing from what the people have to say. This is the event we held. Go back to uh, the uh, to try to apply indigenous knowledge, the intergenerational dialogues that we've uh, tried to carry out, because there is a lot of knowledge by the elders. But what we have seen is that the knowledge is not transmitted to the young people. Yet young people, at least in Uganda, constitute about seventy. Uh, five or eight percent, seventy-eight percent plus of uh, the total population. So these engagements and uh, inter-ethnic engagements, we think, are helping a lot to try to bridge the gap of information. And um, even the tree planting activities, of course, there is one there, young person planting. But we try to have as many young people as possible to participate in riverbank restoration. Um, then, of course. Young people have been engaged severally. Uh, we are trying to see if social media can try to bring the other young people who are so much in school to try to understand this kind of Fire knowledge. I'm sorry, that can you, have, you have a minute left. Okay. So is, finally, there is a, a bamboo here, which is uh, an illustration of how it is trying to offer catchment uh, of, um, of the banks. The bamboo that is on the upper left, when there was flooding at some point, the area that didn't have this uh, traditional or indigenous plant was uh, was swept away. But this very small area illustrated that the indigenous tree, indigenous plant can help a lot. So this is what we have tried to plant. About 2,000 indigenous trees have been planted uh, in the area. So I will, I will stop there. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Aliguma, for that very interesting and insightful presentation about the connection between the indigenous communities and their own ways to adapt and make solutions to the changes around the environment. And I believe that this is something that we should foster and show how uh, show to younger generations to appreciate their local heritage. And uh, maybe we have some interesting questions here, but uh, because of um, the, the time, uh, we can uh, accommodate these later on. And uh, I'd like to proceed um, to the last presenter for today. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce, briefly introduce um, Dr. Marjorie Balayas. So um, Dr. Balayas is an indigenous Kanai'i from the Philippines, and she's an independent researcher who works around disaster risk reduction and indigenous knowledge. Um, she has a PhD in social work and a master's degree in social justice. And uh, Marjorie is currently um, working for international development in the Philippines with a focus on climate change, gender, and, com uh, and economy. So I'd like to um, give the floor now to Dr. Balayas. Thank you so much and good evening, everyone. So I will be talking about uh, the Typhoon Early Warning Systems of the Indigenous Kankanai people. But let me just find my, oh, where is it? I have to share my slides. Oh, yes. Very sorry, that took a while. Yes, yeah, so I'll be talking about the type one early warning systems of the indigenous Kankanai people in the northern Philippines. But before anything else, I'd like to welcome you into the Indigenous Kankanai Bonfire or Atato, where we will be sharing about, you know, stories about their Typhoon early warning systems. So let me just welcome you into the 
bonfire. Piat Atu is a space for solidarity and dialogue for the indigenous Kankanai people, and this is very important to them. It is also a space by which they construct and pass down knowledges to the younger generation. As a space for solidarity and dialogue, Piat Atu also welcomes outsiders to participate in the conversations about indigenous peoples and their issues and express solidarity with their struggles. And since you have been welcomed into the indigenous Kankana and Atato, you are also provided access into their greater ancestral domain, which is found in the northern Philippines. Let me just um, run through quickly with a background on indigenous peoples and disaster risk reduction. So indigenous peoples' perspectives provide that humans and nature are intrinsically linked with the emphasis that humans are a part of nature. The symbiotic relationship triggers responses from humans for any changes such as natural hazards that occur in the natural environment and vice versa. In the case of typhoons, indigenous responses to these natural processes and changes are expressed in the forms of indigenous knowledges and practices, or what we call early warning systems. An example of this indigenous knowledge on early warning systems would be the reading of the changes in the heavenly bodies, such as the movement of clouds, the positions of heavenly bodies, by which the indigenous Kankanai people base their actions for uh, mitigation. However, recently there is an increasing erratic patterns in the changes that are occurring in the natural environment such that the indigenous peoples can no longer come up with precise predictions in terms of the occurrences of natural hazards such as typhoons. And this has affected their uh, vulnerability to these natural hazards. Of course, this is not to um, set aside the social and economic, economic inequalities that are the primary sources of indigenous peoples' vulnerabilities. But indigenous people, such as the Kankanai people, acknowledge the limitations of indigenous knowledges in a currently complicated environment as a sole response to natural hazards such as typhoons. So that in acknowledgement of these limitations, the indigenous Kankanai people have started searching for improved early warning systems to mitigate their losses from typhoons, such as agricultural losses, destruction of indigenous sacred sites such as the Pakudlan. The Pakudlan is the most sacred um, uh, heritage of the indigenous Kankanai in the Philippines and also loses of lives. So in this search for an improved early warning system, they have learned to combine both indigenous and scientific knowledges. And the processes of combining this indigenous and scientific knowledges are natural or it, they, they occur naturally uh, which means that which means that no one has uh, taught them to 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 integrate scientific knowledge into their uh, indigenous knowledges. Now, how does that scientific and indigenous knowledge work together? Let me just um, uh, show you here a conversation between a mother in Asan on how the integrated approach works for the indigenous Kankanai people. I think the audio is not sh being shared here, actually. 
I'm sorry. Dr. Marjorie, would you mind just resharing with the sound? It's it's a setting on Zoom where you just have to click on share sound before you share your screen. Okay. It seems like a very interesting conversation to hear, so it would be very, very helpful. Thank you. I don't think I can I can find that. So could you stop uh, sharing your screen once? And then when you uh, share the screen again, could you make sure that sharing sound is, um, there's a tick check on sharing sound? I have actually done that, but it seems like it's not working, so. Okay. Well, it would be possible for us to uh, send a recording via email or through the, um, Ecomos channel, uh, Ecrom channel later. So uh, please uh, move forward with your presentation. Sorry okay, for that. Okay, yeah, anyway, I'm sorry about that. No worries, this is not your fault. Thank uh, you so much. Okay. Yeah, so the conversation was about uh, how the mother has actually um, referred to indigenous knowledge first. And then she also sought um, uh, mm -hmm. scientific knowledge in terms of uh, 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 Taking response for as every uh, as a disaster risk reduction measure. Sorry, could you sorry, please can uh, you hear me? Yes, could you please make the slideshow um in uh, presentation mode again? I think it's in presentation mode. We are seeing the first see page right now. This is the conversation. Can you see it? No, we're on the first page of the presentation in um just your PowerPoint screen at the moment. Oh no, it's just one moment. What about that? Is it working? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. All right, good. Can you hear the sound? No. No, the sound is not being shared still. Okay, anyway. All right, I'm very sorry about that. So yeah, it's about a conversation between a mother and a son where the mother sought first indigenous knowledge in terms of her preparations for what she thought was an upcoming typhoon. And then also she referred to uh, scientific uh, uh, knowledge that is the, the weather forecast from the radio station as she has asked her her, her son to, to put on the radio for for the uh, scientific weather forecast. So um, there was no typhoon apparently, but it was a good practice for the family because they have been proactive. Uh, the, the conversation actually went on from this one and there was a strong rain that happened during the night, which would have been harmful to the animals and the, uh, 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 the the plants in the farm. So it was a good measure for the mother and the child to have uh, made use of both indigenous and uh, scientific knowledges in terms of the responses to what they thought was an upcoming typhoon. So to present that uh, in my research, this is how the integrated early warning systems of the indigenous Kankanai people look like. In terms of sources for indigenous knowledge, it is from the reading of the signs that are conveyed by heavenly bodies, movements of insects from trees to lower surfaces, such as stone walls, changes in the behaviors of animals in mig migratory bird movements. Why is that for scientific knowledge? It is from weather forecasts such as television, radio, and newsprints, and use of rain gouges, automatic weather stations, and satellites. For indigenous knowledges, these are generated from lived experiences and the relationships between humans and nature, and also from cultural history. While as for scientific knowledge, these are generated from external influences, formal institutions, and the processes of migration and resettlement. Indigenous knowledges are conveyed through the practice of indigenous daily lives. That's why I have mentioned earlier that the process of uh, integrating indigenous and scientific knowledges take a natural process. 
and scientific knowledges, on the other hand, are conveyed through written materials, visual diagrams, educational campaigns, conversations between outsiders and the indigenous community. Now, what are the challenges and opportunities of integrating indigenous and scientific knowledges as a form of early warning uh, system for typhoons? There is the issue here about power relations. Now, the question about the integration process is naturally occurring. When it's naturally occurring, what has more power for the integration? The elders actually lament about the younger indigenous kankanaay who have abandoned indigenous knowledges in favor of scientific knowledges. So if scientific knowledge, for instance, has more power in terms of uh, uh, getting itself embedded into the indigenous people's perspectives, communities, and processes, then uh, the, the issue of, of, of the power between indigenous and scientific knowledges has also to be, needs also to be acknowledged and uh, unsettled. Also, host indigenous knowledges is being integrated in the process, and this has something to do also with the power relations within and amongst indigenous peoples. In my research, I have found out that there is also some sort of power struggle amongst indigenous peoples themselves, like people who are wealthier, people who hold positions, people who are actually more educated than the rest have the tendency to, to, to impose on what knowledges they would want to be uh, highlighted in terms of the practice of indigenous knowledges and practices. And therefore, there is a need for a relational bridge to open up further dialogue between indigenous and scientific warning systems that addresses power relations. In conclusion, um, indigenous knowledge just actually have the beauty of uh, recognizing and incorporating other forms of knowledges as we have found out in the in the conversations between the mother and the son and also in the, the summary of how the integrated indigenous Kankanai people's early warning systems look like. And also when certain conditions and relationships are met and honored, both forms of knowledge can contribute to the strengthening of people and communities' resilience to disasters. What are these conditions that need to be met and honored? These are actually uh, important, and that's why it is also important to, to, to uh, be in indigenous people's spaces for solidarity and dialogue, such as the Atu of the Kankanaay people, because these are where these uh, conditions are uh, are talked upon by both, you know, the indigenous peoples and outsiders who are coming to learn with them. Knowledge systems such as scientific and indigenous are not completely compatible, and at times these are in tension with one another. So it's not always compatible. And therefore, responding to issues of power and power relations and continuing commitment through research and practice to seek how different forms of knowledge contribute to building community resilience to hazards is important. It's not necessary that indigenous and scientific knowledges will become compatible and always in tandem with one another. There are always tensions, and this also needs to be uh, recognized along the process. So that's it. I th thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Marjorie. Um, and thank you so much to all of the presentations, the fantastic presentations. And as a researcher in um, mixed heritage sites where the natural and cultural um, values coexist, it was really interesting to hear all of your stories. Uh, we will now move on to asking some questions. And first, uh, as the discussants, we would like to ask a few questions um, especially addressing the traditional knowledge bearers um, along, who has alongside joined us uh, in this session. Uh, we will start from um, of the presentation in Sudan. And uh, the question is, um, how does it feel to be given 
a level of autonomy or independence in the way um, you manage your life, your land, and the, uh, the traditional bearers um, have been given in uh, managing their land. What help would you uh, would the traditional people like from governments and international organizations now that there is a level of independence and a recognition of the value of that um, independent um, management? Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Isra Al Gadi. I'm the project manager of HART. And uh, I'm gonna take this question on behalf of my colleague Inas. So, uh, uh, what is happening? And just from 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 our side, Tuti, uh, there is a, a huge um, influence of uh, of uh, the independence of uh, the inhabitants of Tuti. Uh, uh, first, uh, it came from uh, the the ownership of the lands. So the ownership of the land of Tuti is completely different from the. Uh, other ownership in in other places in uh, in uh, in Khartoum uh, in, in in the capital, so that influenced their um, their power in managing whatever happens inside their island. Also, there is uh, the 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 incident that happened uh, during the British colonization. Uh, when uh, the, uh, the 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 British uh, government uh, asked. The, the the people to leave the island and uh, they they didn't uh leave and then when the flood happened uh he refused to provide them with supplies uh to protect themselves from the flood it was one of the major floods that happened in sudan back in 1946 uh, so uh from that moment on, and when they decided that to protect themselves, what no matter what, and they are not going to de depend on this, it it uh, provided a base of something customary and known between the islanders. So they are completely depend independent, uh, even till now. Uh, nobody can enter the island or, or uh, do anything without their consent or without referring to them. And that's what happened uh, by recognizing uh, the, the, the flood committee became the, 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 the main body to, uh, to coordinate the efforts between the official side uh, from the government and between the inhabitants and the knowledge bearer and the islanders. So um, I guess it influenced them more. Uh, and uh, our side, Tuti, presents uh, a, an example of uh, coordinating efforts between, between the locals and uh, the government side, and it can be achieved and it can uh, uh, make great results. So the island has, has endured flood for, for, for several years, and usually they don't have any casualties and they have uh, the least uh, loss and damages, uh, although they are in the middle of 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 uh, of the two lies and the Nile comes out too. so basically they are uh, highly prone uh, to 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 flood the risks yes thank you so another question that i had was about the young people uh, in the region um leaving tuti how has that been uh, an issue and how do you think of the future? What do you think uh, it would be a good solution in uh, bringing them back um, from uh, this different, these different occupations that they may seek outside of the island to uh, becoming successors to the traditions that have developed on the island? Uh, okay, that's interesting questions uh, question because uh, 
from what we uh, gained from the interviews uh, with the community is that uh, basically they leave the island uh, and also because, you know, the ownership and when the land moves from a generation to generation and families are expanding. So some uh, a lot of cases uh, for youth to leave, they want to start their own families and they want to have like a bigger plot of land. So and this is uh, becomes uh, impossible. Uh, in Tuti because of the, the, the extension of generations. So they go outside Tuti and reside there. But the interesting thing is that they have this special bond. And I remember uh, one of the influential and active uh, members of the, uh, the flood committee, he said, I don't live in Tuti. But uh, I, I've never felt that that I that I left. So and actually, he he he's, he manages the logistics uh, of, of of the uh, basically the barricading supplies into the island. So he never left. And whenever we 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 go to the site visits, we we, we find him. Uh, sometimes uh, when uh, the, the the flood is immense, uh, and so they come to the island to support their families and you know their 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 beloved ones. They they establish this link but still uh it is a factor to be considered and and to look at it in depth and to to make the proper bridging between those who leave and 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 to sustain this practice of the tire system yeah thank you so much that's very interesting to hear that the connection between the land doesn't um, disappear even if you're not physically there. That connection is deeper than the sort of phys um, geographical uh, location that they are on. Um, and it's, that seems very, very hopeful for um, the future in uh, continuing with the traditions uh, at Tyre. Oh, sorry, Tuti, sorry. Yes, uh, yes. If you allow me, John, I just want to reflect also in your first question. And uh, uh, when you said, what do you think the kind of support that they uh, would need from uh, the government or international players? Um, through our study of the Thai system, I think one of the you know, weakest uh, 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 parts is... Uh, after the flood, the actions of recovery and prevention. And this is the challenges that they face every year uh, to be able to uh, um, find long-term or uh, sustainable solutions for the flood rather than repeating the, st the same uh, responses strategies, which is does not prevent, but they actually just respond to the flood. And this is because of the limited of, uh, limits of funding, maybe also the technical capacity and so on. So I think uh, by training, maybe the community and also uh, empowering them to, to be able to identify and to, to have you know, better access for technical or non-technical uh, measures for flood prevention and uh, 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 long-term solutions for the flood risk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was very really interesting to hear that it is the aftermath that is that where the help is most required. Uh, we will now uh, move on to uh, asking some questions to our, our participants from Egypt. All right. Uh, thank you, Kenta. And uh, I'd like to take over now. Um... So it was very quite interesting um, to learn more about um, the Coptic, the use of Coptic calendar, and um, I think my first question would be um, related to how has climate change influenced the agricultural practices in Egypt, and what implications does this hold for the preservation and interpretation of Egypt's cultural heritage? Okay, for how the climate change has uh, in, has an impact over the agriculture sector in Egypt, especially in Burj Rashid, where we are talking. Uh, first of all, because of um, we had uh, we have a, uh, a raising in the in the temperatures, which is coming from 14 centigrade till 21 uh, till. Uh, 
16 Celsius, which means that even uh, with all the projections that we have from IPCC and from the integrated coastal uh, management project for, uh, for the northern coast of Egypt, uh, that this temperature is going to raise from 1.5 uh, till 2 degrees. Uh, this, is, this is one thing. The other thing is that the precipitation of the raining, uh, of uh, the rainfall in the dry season also is, is, uh, uh, is uh, increasing uh, not, uh, from uh, 4.13 millimeters to minus 3 millimeters, which means uh, that we have a scarcity of water, and in the same time we we have a, uh, a, a an elevation in the temperatures, which means that we will have a kind of uh, hydraulic draft causing that the spaces of the or or, or um, uh, the lakes that we have and uh, the sources of water will we will have much more evaporization. And it will, uh, and a scarcity of water is coming with a, high, a decreasing in the salinization of the land. Uh, and in the same time, uh, the flood of the Nile, which already bringing a kind of sedimentary uh, lemon and uh, mud uh, each year, now because of the several dams that was built all over the Nile, this flood has been uh, stopped even. The Rashidian people I, are talking about when the Nile stop uh, the or been cutting. Even they, this is their word that the, the, the Nile has been cutting. This this has make a, a kind of shrinking in the land, and uh, at the same time, uh, most of the population, which which uh, which is like seventeen percent of the population, are working in this uh, in the field of agriculture because this is. Uh, this is the cultural uh, aspect of living there. Uh, the new generation is uh, just lift this kind of activities. They even we have a high uh, percentage in the illicit uh, illicit traf traffic, and they are in, uh, migrating to uh, Ill illicitly and illegitimately to Italy and uh, especially from this point because they want to, um, they are searching of uh, uh, other uh, kind of livelihood. Uh, uh, this impact, of course, um, I think one of the major impact also that we have, we have here is the, uh, the stop on of the transmission of this knowledge. Now you have a, a science in the, in the Coptic calendar in itself. This is not an, a primitive, but this is a very high science that was uh, transmitted all over because they are much more, they can read the sky more than anybody who can read it. it and, and they know from, from, they know from the stars, we are when and uh, what will coming, what we are expecting. In two days, we are expecting a kind of uh, storm. In two days, we are expecting a flash flood in two days and so on. So uh, this transmission will be completely being lost. The documentation of such a, 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 a traditional knowledge and uh, embedded it with the new technology uh, and uh, from even uh, from our, this is the, from this session, it is the, the talk under the tree. So one of the trees has been completely disappeared there and it, it was the sycamore tree. And the sycamore tree in Egypt is the tree which where everybody is, has been gathering under its shade and where, where this is the cycle of the transmission of this knowledge. And this tree has been completely been absent due to this change also. The change in culture, the change in climate, the, the, the rupture between, uh, between generations. So we replanted the tree again and we are making a awareness through the use. And uh, this, is not, uh, this is not enough. We are searching for making a kind of... Um, income coming from uh, making uh, new project depending on the traditional uh, crafts there and related to the environment and uh, i think uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the local community and the government we are doing uh, 
um, is such a minor project with the youth. And uh, we hope that all of them will be, in, uh, will, will, all this generation will be gathered once more under the tree. All right, thank you so much, Amira. And uh, I really understand like the, the challenges and the, uh, the efforts that you have to take in order for um, knowledge transmissions to be successful. We, and actually it's very crucial and very important right now. And, uh, and thank you for all what you do. And uh, I'd like to um, give the, the floor to Valentina for other um, additional questions for our presenters from Egypt or Sudan. Yes, thank you. Okay, so at first, we would like to know if the projects you are developing uh, have bring you hope in terms of adaptation to climate change, and if so, how? And also, it will be interesting for you if you can tell us how you have seen the community react to this project. Yeah, I, 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 if uh, Isra will begin or me, uh, my dear if Isra, you if you want to begin. I think you can. You can. Okay. Okay, for um, uh, your question was uh, how, how the community have received this, yes? And uh, if, if it is bringing hope or not. The, we have named the project between the community there, Haya, which means life as the tree of sycamore is life, the life tree. And uh, what was, uh, we began this, uh, this project by doing a, a series of workshops through the, through the children, their families, and the youth, uh, youth and, uh, and even with their families, with the elders. And I think this has 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 uh, bring hope in in one way that we can we are here we can hear each other. This is a circle where every your voice is counting. We will take you, you we will take even uh, your observation on a respectful uh, level. And uh, this is why we brought with us the parliament members and we brought with us the high level of uh, the governmental uh, sector. And what was very good that the, the governmental sector, uh, um, when we talked with the, with, the, with the whole population, we found that one of the main risks also there is the absence of uh, the sewerage system, which uh, we with uh, this lack of this system with the chain with the with uh, the flash flood and uh, uh, and the salinization, it's uh, highly deteriorated the land also. So the, what the, the community was asking for as a need for them is that this kind of uh, infrastructure uh, network of storage have to be implemented. Of course, as our, uh, with this project, I cannot, this is, is a high level uh, decision to make. But really, when the parliament succeeds, the parliament members succeed with the initiative uh, presidential uh, um, we have an organization, uh, an NGO, but, but but related to the presidential bureau. They succeed to really make this uh, network, this uh, sewerage network. And from here, the hope and the trust begin, because they can they can uh, see and they can uh, have a tangible uh, things that really affected the, their life. And from here, we even adjust some some of their uh, uh, of their um, of their idea related to the environment. For example, they wanted that this network has to be in plastic because anything related with uh, uh, the pottery or uh, or this is very ancient and this, we don't need that. But of course, this is, was more environmental. So we sat with them and say to them, "This is you have to take this because this is better for your health." This is better for the yeah, health of your children. And even after one or two workshops with the children, the children have an impact on their parents and uh, they accept this. And I think this is was really a, a, um, a joy for our hearts. This is not only bringing hope, but it was a joy. OK, 
Okay, thank you so much for this answer. And I really like the part that you mentioned that different generations are involved. So the hope is not only like in kids, but in the whole community. I think that makes a lot of sense of how, okay, how you think about to protect the knowledge that is being generated, but also how the project can be like sustainable in long term, like in terms of time. So I think it's super interesting and valuable to emphasize on that part. And I don't know if someone from the uh, Sudanese team is here and would like to share their answer with us. No wonder. Okay. Well, I think we can move on to asking questions for our, our colleagues from uh, Uganda now. Uh, and the question is, so in your video, it was really interesting to hear about how the indigenous people, the local community, uh, has created their traditional knowledge around the natural phenomenon. And what was really striking was one of the leaders saying that the floods happen when the gods are angry. When, you know, it is in reality climate change, which has nothing to do with what they have been doing or with their livelihood, they, it's out of their control. But still, in that knowledge system, of course, it is a sense of punishment, which would be very, very scary, I think, for the local community as well. So I was just wondering how um, has the local community been able to combine modern science and the traditions in moving forward in today's society? Sorry, I, I got your introduction to the question. I didn't hear the, the start of the question. You're asking how the indigenous knowledge is, is being operated in modern science, is that the question? So it's, it's just, I guess it's just sort of how the, um, it has been able to uh, adapt and combine. Um, has it been a difficult process? How has, been, how has it been to sort of get, um, give them a better sense of um understanding and like i guess one thing that i really hope is not happening is that they really blame their climate change on something that they're doing i was just wondering how they are adjusting to the changes in the natural phenomenon um with their tradition whether modern science has been helping or how has how has that relation been well, I the, the local community really uh, feels um, modern uh, technologies have not um, have not helped because there are trees, for example, in restoring river banks that were that were in, introduced, um, and these were eucalyptus trees. I don't know how I don't know if that's a general term used, and. The local community feels, for example, that these trees just taking a lot of water from their from their rivers, from the gardens, and they instead don't provide strong catchment. Yet some scientists or well uh, implement uh, policy implementers felt providing trees would provide a solution uh, to river bank restoration or. Uh, mitigating other impacts of climate change. So the local community hasn't really felt uh, that modern science has helped. However, uh, the engagements, like I showed in the presentation, um, having the local communities interact with uh, policymakers at various levels, I think is helping. And these are, these are really uh, uh, opportunities for the local people to put out what they feel will work well in terms of uh, uh, incorporating the indigenous knowledge in uh, modern systems of climate action. So I don't know whether that tries to, to answer your question. Oh, this is fantastic. Thank you very much. So I guess it has been mostly a top-down uh, implementation that has really lost trust of the yes. local people. Yes. 
True, true, true. It has really been top down. Even some of the people who uh, designed some of these policies haven't reached the ground. And like Frederick mentioned on day one, my colleague, there is a strong disconnect of the people at the ministry and the very local people. So even our project trying to get some of these people to, uh, to visit uh, the uh, grounds where we are trying to implement uh, this uh, net zero hatred for climate action projects was a challenge. So it's at the regional level where they have started appreciating, but we really have a lot to do. I've just been listening to other presentations. I think the appreciation of indigenous knowledge or indigenous science uh, hasn't been uh, something very important, but I think this is gaining really attraction and we really need to keep pushing, pushing and pushing and working with local communities. Do you see a uh, difference in the way um, the government has reacted to uh, your project after it has been implemented and after uh, seeing its success? Yes, the local government at least has really responded well. Um, the, we have the local councils uh, in Kasese uh, district. They have really responded well and the village committee uh, that was formed uh, to support climate action is uh, is working with the district authority. So there is a lot of support really uh, for the project and the afterlife of the project. So we, we are a bit um, uh, we're a bit uh, strengthened by the support uh, to the committee. We are sure that the trees, the indigenous trees that were planted around the river uh, will be will grow because there is support from the district, the local people are involved, the young people are involved. So it was a whole combination of the people. So in terms of the local government, I think we, we are really successful. In terms of the central government, the high level, it is still a challenge, and I think that's what we need to really address um, Yeah, going forward. What do you think is the disconnect between the reaction from the local government and the central government? Is it just because they don't see the value, or is it just because the success has been too limited? What do you think is needed for the central government to start recognizing the values of the traditional um, knowledges? Well, it's really good. Uh, it's a good question and good observation. I think generally heritage has not been given the uh, the importance, it, the significance it deserves for most development interventions, at least in Uganda or even uh, internationally. So we, at the local level, it's easier for the people to interact with the work that we have done. And at the national level, one, it is actually expensive to transport these people to some of these sites. It's about uh, three, 400 kilometers, 300, 400 kilometers where we've implemented the project in and the Renzori Mountains National Park, the heritage site. Um, I think lack of appreciation of heritage, one, but also we need to keep, uh, we need to develop as many cases as possible to, to push for heritage as a, as a driver for climate action. So I think the disconnect also from the local communities I mean, the local government and the state uh, authorities at uh, the national level is appreciation of heritage and maybe lack of resources to, to try to involve them. Uh, probably we need to draw more strategies in making sure that uh, the national uh, government, I mean, the national level stakeholders are involved as much as possible. So that would call for uh, some more programming, uh, but also uh, a lot of writing, at least some of these people are interested in reading and uh, we try to write. And uh, I think more dissemination at national level, it might be expensive, but we could do it innovatively. Um, for example, the university that we worked with, Makere University, uh, is at national level and uh, we weren't asked money to, to have some of their lecturers visit the site. So, I think we can. We should use really many, um, many avenues uh, to make sure that uh, the people at the national level are involved. Yeah, thank you. Good question indeed. 
Thank you very much. I guess a bottom-up approach really needs a lot more support than something that comes from a government official. And I guess it's the participants of this session who can really be um, the catalysts to create such changes around the world. Um, and I will just pass on to uh, Carl to ask questions to our colleagues from the Philippines. All right. Uh, thank you, Kenta. Um, we will accommodate all the questions, maybe after Marjorie, because uh, we have limited time. So, um, yeah, my my, curious, my, uh, my question is for Marjorie, and uh, I'm also from the Philippines. I'm curious to know, since our country is uh, experiencing immense climate changes over the past few years, and uh, these changes are now felt more than ever, and a sea level rise, for example, stronger typhoons, and uh, I wanted to ask and to know if these um, kankana e, I'm, I'm sorry if I pronounce it right, uh, I'm sorry, wrong. <laughs> uh, these traditions or knowledge systems, um, were, were they able to adapt um, despite the changes in the weather systems recently? Yes, thank you so much for the question. The indigenous kankana e knowledges and practices are also evolving. So what what what's uh, actually um uh beautiful about this indigenous kankanai people's knowledge is, is that as they live their everyday lives you know everyday lives are also evolving so it follows that their indigenous knowledges and practices are also evolving so i guess your question about those changes in the natural environment such as you know rising sea levels more frequent and stronger typhoons frequent landslides because those are what we get here in in the uh, mountainous part of the country. The indigenous people's knowledges have also adapted to that. And I think it's actually one of the reasons why they had to integrate other forms of knowledges so that they can respond to these uh, changes that have not occurred in the past wherein they have successfully made use of plain indigenous knowledges as a form of a response or approach to those uh, natural hazards all right uh also um I'm, I'm curious to know also marjorie if um, there are any new knowledge systems or ways that were developed based from these adaptation what were there any form of resistance as well against using mo modern early systems or modern systems i mean yeah as i have mentioned in my presentation um there have you know indigenous knowledges and scientific knowledge don't always you know agree together, they don't always come together. So um, I don't think from my research, there was actually not a mention about any form of a resistance from the indigenous peoples for the introduction of this uh, uh, scientific knowledges or external knowledges. And I think what is important in here is that the external knowledges or the scientific knowledges that will be integrated to indigenous people's knowledges will have to, to, to take place in a space such as the bonfire session or the atato, wherein there are certain conditions and relationships that are honored to make sure that it does not become, you know, a struggle for the indigenous peoples in terms of embracing these new forms of knowledge. All right. Thank you so much, Marjorie. And I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of... Um, uh, knowledge systems as well that could be um, utilized for um, future adaptation efforts in the Philippines and in the region. Um, I would like to give the floor to Kenta maybe um, for the next set of questions or to open the floor for yes, our audience. Uh, hi, Kenta and Carl. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think we are running a bit uh, late, not in the sense I'm, I'm sure you guys are doing great. I just wanted to open the floor for questions from the audience because I see a lot of hands raised. So sorry to interrupt, but uh, maybe we yeah, can that's start. That's what we were doing anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, please move on. So, Samia, she had her hand raised i don't know if she wants to talk right now or we can start with david in the meanwhile yeah david go ahead please yes yes thank you so much can you hear me yes i'm david david from rwanda actually university of rwanda uh i i'm a professor in heritage studies and management and I do teach heritage studies and some components of history. So 
Mine is just to substantiate on what um, my colleague from Uganda was talking about. And uh, the issue of community engagement and uh, the central uh, government. Practically in Africa, we are most of our countries in Africa still working uh, using the colonial template of the top down approach. And uh, this has distanced communities from managing their heritage. Uh, and and uh, it has uh, created that uh, a lack of self pride in their heritage, and it is something that we are we are trying to to work on. Like in Rwanda, we are trying to decolonize heritage management practices uh, from central to decentralized uh, models of uh, of management or the bottom up approach. Uh, that can really bring back, restore uh, the pride, restore the trust of these local communities in managing their heritage. So that's uh, uh, one way of how we can at least uh, bring back these communities in to be actively engaged. And most of the times you find there is no integrated planning process. Uh, Everything is done at the central level, and you find the communities are not involved. Uh, and uh, they actually see uh, see things be being done to them or on behalf of them instead of working with them. So most of the th they, they stand aside and they, uh, look at uh, these infrastructures or any developments on heritage as government projects, and they are not concerned. So that's also another issue of not involving local communities in the planning process of the of heritage management and conservation. And most of them actually through the researches we have done and the, uh, the publication we have made, you find them saying, we cannot own what we don't understand. If we, we are trying to make, to bring in the ownership mindset, but they don't understand what they are supposed to own. And also they say, we don't want to see things. We, uh, we want to be part of, uh, we, we don't want to see results. We want to be part of the results. So there is that gap that we are trying uh, to fix in Africa. And uh, I believe uh, for the case of Rwanda, we are trying to see how we can uh, really bring in <clears throat> the effective decentralization of heritage management practices so that these communities can actively be engaged and uh, have the ownership mindset uh, in the management of their heritage. Thank you. Thank you, David, so much. And is it true? It's really a contradiction how we can just try to preserve trad traditional knowledge, but at the same time trying to do it with colonial methods. So it's interesting to see how we can just match these two things, how we can rethink the process and how we can rethink the methods. So thank you so much for your intervention. Now we are going to listen to Aparna and after we will go with Samia. Okay, Aparna, are you there? Can you, can you hear me? Sorry, uh, sorry, I was... Uh trying to unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much for this lovely panel and such wonderful, uh, I must say the moderators, facilitators, kudos to you and all the presenters. It's been a rich fair for me and uh, listening to all of you. I was uh, wondering, uh, one question I had, there's been so much said about bottom-up approaches and, you know, uh, working uh, on with the indigenous knowledge. But at the same time, I would like to ask almost all presenters and all moderators one key question. Uh, today, when we sit down and we glorify uh, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, we still have to think and maybe ask ourselves one question. And that is that Many times, many years ago, millennia ago, or like you know, when these human settlements came into being, these people uh, who came, who were our ancestors, uh, they worked with the environment, which was tough, often harsh, 
and they fought with this, you know, uh, they um, adapted themselves, their life ways, their cultures to the land and the, these culture, climate stories, you know, which we have been talking all about through this conference developed. But then on the other hand, how has their life improved? How would they like to improve their lives? If given an opportunity, would they like to stay on in these places which are becoming impossible to live in? And can we really bypass governments? We cannot bypass governments. The point is that we do need to build a future where governments and people work together governments to do their job and bottom up uh, you know and of course the governance has to be responding to the needs of the communities and and it has to be inclusive governance it has to be just governance yet at the same time we cannot do away with the governance so more of a so my question is are we thinking about this how our actions about its safeguard can help improve the lives of indigenous people and are there any strategies or any any such models or any such examples where life quality of life has improved in these places in these habitats in these uh, um, ecosystems where these communities are struggling with the uh, you know and if there are such examples then also we should you know, invite from our audience, there have been successful examples where we, we've seen this participatory kind of an approach. Thank you very much for the question, Aparna. Um, does any of the participants, our colleagues uh, who presented their work have, would like to answer this question? I see a hand up. I think that's a question hand. <laughs> uh, just a, a little bit from me. Um, I have done a little bit of work uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. And there uh, is a system called Bolsa Floresta, uh, which is a grant uh, given to the riverine communities that live uh, in remote communities uh, that are basically only accessible by boat uh, in that region. And what it does is that it creates um, an incentive. It's a, a bursary given to communities that uh, follow a certain standard of uh, an environmental stewardship. And that allows uh, these communities to receive educational uh, resources and um funding for medica medication, etc., uh, by um, following these uh, guidelines to be stewards of their environment um, in, and in sort of practicing sustainable um, strategies. I think that worked very well to sort of um, really help them feel that there is a way forward that allows them to stay in their community and live in their traditional way while um, getting the benefits of a modern environment that is, you know, rewarding and, of course, really integra integrating with the rest of the world in a way that they like. They can take the lead in how much they want to be integrated and... Um, they they are given the financial means to sort of make that decision. I thought that was a very um, good case study in uh, making ways forward. I mean, it does um, cost quite a bit, and there is you know the infrastructure that needs to develop um, for that. But I think that was a pretty good example. Um, does anyone from the audience or the floor have a, uh, anything to say, um, David? Please keep it short to maybe two minutes, sorry, because we are running out of time. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Me is just something small uh, to clarify on the need for government to be part of, uh, like, we need government. But what we are saying is that uh, 
we need that kind of uh, heritage governance, including even the public institutions. Who are the stakeholders involved? <clears throat> How are they coordinated? We need that. And uh, not, uh, also we need the legal and the uh, policy frameworks in these countries. Uh, how are they informed? We need policies and legal frameworks that are informed from the bottom, from the communities themselves, not at the central level where they design the, uh, policies uh, th thinking on behalf of the communities. Let these policies, let these legal frameworks be informed from the bottom. That's what we, we need uh, in Africa and maybe in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, it's very important that it, you know, we recognize the similarities that's global. And of course, you know, things that are challenges at the regional level as well to understand uh, the whole picture of the challenges we face. And Aparna, thank you so much for your question. We will move on as we are running out of time. Um, we will take the final question from uh, the, um, the audience from Samia. Um, thank, could you so them, please? thank you so much. Uh, appreciate. Um, um, I really appreciate the conference. I appreciate this session the most. I think there is some valuable conversation happening on the chat, and I would like to lift a very important issue that is coming up, at least for me in the chat. First of all, a request. Can we share the chat with the audience? That will be great. There are some links in there. There are some absolutely wonderful conversations that's happening. And since Aparna is here, I would like to pitch for a leadership from UNESCO ICROM to have some kind of a shared spreadsheet where indigenous communities can put their needs and international communities can see those needs and come up with strategies to support indigenous communities across, across nation states and across institutions. That is a big need that I can identify through the chat. That would be such a superb service to our community so that we can use leverage our resources to really map and deliver the needs for indigenous communities because if anyone is going to save us from climate change, it's gonna be the indigenous communities. And we need to know about those communities. We need to leverage all our scientific resources to support, advocate, and supply our resources towards the indigenous communities. They are in a minority with the majority of the resources that we need to mitigate climate change. For any strategy of environmental justice, science is not going to help us because science, the way it has been conceived and industrialized, is at the root cause of the climate crisis. And as Einstein very well put, we cannot solve the problem with the same mindset that created the problem. So we need indigenous communities and their knowledge that needs to be spread as far wide as possible so all scientific communities can leverage their resources to learn from the expertise we need to redefine who is the expert in climate change mitigation, which for me is the indigenous community. Thank you so much, Samia. And I agree with you. We also need to rethink how are the relations between people and environment, because we, we tend to, to focus on the solutions, like how the indigenous knowledge uh, can help us to resolve. But besides that and beyond that is more like how us as you humans, we interact with the environment. And it's really interesting to see how indigenous communities uh, interact and how they understand like the whole uh, system itself, which is really different from what we usually do. Uh, so thank you so much for this intervention. And now we would like to start concluding with two questions uh, for the previous speakers. So. The first one is, um, 
why do you think it is important to involve young people in this process, in the process you are developing? And what message would you like to tell young people are a worldwide in sustaining traditional knowledge? So is anyone there who would like to answer first? Yes, uh, this is Isra again. Um, yes. And apologies, I didn't uh, hear the, the last question uh, clear. So um, the first part is, uh, the first part of the question is, uh, why do we think the youth are important? Um, from what I uh, from uh, from what I experienced throughout this project is uh, to having the youth involved is fatal and it is important, and uh, and because uh, it needs a lot of work and youth they do have the energy they do have the innovation and they do have the motivation, so definitely a motivation of a young man and it eighteen years old and above. Is definitely it's not like a uh, man uh, forty and above. So definitely they do have the energy, and also they uh, they have the mechanism. When you are young, you have the mechanism to adapt and to cope and come up with new solutions. So I think uh, that uh, the youth are uh, a force that cannot be uh, taken for granted. Uh, the other part is what I want to say to, to youth. Uh, actually, what I would like to, to tell them that is uh, it is important to be part of your uh, for for your uh, part of your culture, part of your community. It's not something that you get ashamed of. It it is the thing that shapes your identity. So everyone and for for every young man and woman uh, i would like to tell them take pride in 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 in, in where, where you belong to in your take pride in your communities your culture the place that you come from uh, 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 and uh, never never feel disgraced about any kind of habits because this is something given you find yourself uh, in this environment. So take pride in that. And every uh, bit of knowledge from your culture, from the practices of, uh, of your community is valuable and it builds your personality and your input to the future generations. Okay, thank you. I don't know if there is someone else who wants to shortly tell us uh, their answer. I, I want also to reflect on this. It's just uh, very short. It's I think the youth are could be the act like a bridge uh, between the scientific and the indigenous knowledge. Now a lot of discussions here was about the bottom up and top down approach, and also how to integrate the scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge. And the youth are in the better place to do that. Uh, in Tuti, for instance, now they are incorporating survey engineers to do continuing mapping. They use social media for early warning. So this is already there, but the youth, when they are aware and they are feel belonging to their area and traditions, they can act like bridge between this all these concepts. Thank you. Hey, thanks to you. And well, I really like this idea of bridge, like how youth can be the connection between two parts, and it's extremely important. And now I'm going to give the floor to Carl. All right, thank you so much uh, again to our presenters and also to my colleagues here, Kenta and Valentina. Um, we were um, astounded by um, very um, insightful um, knowledge sharing and experiences. And thank you as well for the efforts um, in uh, helping transmit the knowledge systems to younger generations. And uh, thank you as well for our, our organizers and uh, we must continue to support these efforts to preserve these uh, knowledge systems. And we must, uh, I also agree with you that uh, we must involve young people in this process. And uh, by learning from indigenous and traditional wisdom, we can build more um, resilient communities and create a more sustainable future for all. So thank you very much and uh, have a good night and uh, have a good day. Thank you so much, Carl, Kenta and Valentina for beautifully leading this session. It was such a pleasure to hear from all our presenters and uh, 
some key aspects came out of this discussion and we have seen how uh, you know knowledge about natural resource sharing knowledge about disaster preparedness and response knowledge about how to just be in your environment and not over consume overuse and just share with each other uh, brings us together and we can together tackle this climate crisis. So I take this opportunity to thank all the presenters of this panel today and our discussants. You were fantastic. And uh, so actually this panel brings us to the end of our three day event. Uh, I thank all of you who joined us over these three days and uh, engaging with us in this very, very interesting uh, you know, discussion and exchange of ideas. Uh, we have a lot to unpack. And uh, so I take this opportunity to invite uh, Ms. Aparna Tandon, uh, the senior program leader of the First Aid and Resilience for Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis, uh, a flagship program of ECROM, uh, who organized this uh, conference and uh, to share with us a few words and guide us to the conclusion of the conference. The, the floor is yours, Aparna. Thank you, Mohana. Uh, distinguished partners and attendees, <laughs> Uh, over the course of past three days, heritage-based climate action has served as a vibrant platform for building knowledge, sharing traditional wisdom, as well as innovative and integrated strategies for heritage safeguard, disaster risk reduction, and climate action. The last uh, panel, which we have just concluded, exemplifies this under the talking tree. Our discussions have helped us to better understand the impacts of climate change on different forms of heritage and how heritage can act as an instrument of just climate action. So in order to bring this conference to a formal conclusion, I would like to invite our Director General, uh, Honorable Director General of ECROM to provide a uh, concluding note and Good. over to you, Director General. Thank you so much, Aparna. Thank you very, very much. Distinguished speakers, partners and attendees of the International Conference on Heritage-Based Climate Action. Our innovative discussions are coming to a close and we are rounding out ICROM's two years capacity development project, Net Zero, Heritage for Climate Action, conceived within the framework of the ICROM First Aid and Resilience for Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis program, FAR. The participation of representatives from 122 countries in our conference underscores the deep interest and engagement of ICROM member states in this critical area. I'm really so pleased to report that the past three days have propelled forward-looking pathways through enriching panel discussions storytelling, and intergenerational knowledge exchange. It has become more evident than ever that culture and heritage hold significant potential to drive just and inclusive climate action. Cultural heritage and climate action are intrinsically linked as it clearly came out in these days panel discussions. And to move this forward, we need first, to recognize the importance of involving communities in managing and conserving heritage sites in the face of climate crisis. Second, to systematically consider the rights and needs of people while promoting just climate action. Thirdly, to work collaboratively with diverse agencies to advocate for accessible climate financing for the heritage sector. Fourth, prioritize collecting more data and evidence related to loss and damage for living cultures, moving beyond tangible heritage. Fifth, to promote better information sharing and storytelling technique to integrate insights from diverse disciplines into heritage education, empowering professionals to address climate challenges effectively. The five cultural climate stories at our innovation sites in Brazil, Egypt, India, Uganda, and Sudan prove how integrated strategies for heritage safeguarding, disaster risk reduction, climate action, and peace building can be developed by tapping into place-specific, traditional, and indigenous knowledge. I'm very proud of our flagship program's creation of a successful model of capacity development for safeguarding, 
heritage from extreme weather events induced by climate change while simultaneously advancing culture and nature-based solutions. The insights gained from the Net Zero project and the findings of this conference will be disseminated through an open source publication and in-depth conference report. Through collaborative efforts with the governments of all our member states, alongside our international partners, ICROM will facilitate broader implementation of heritage-based climate action for communities at the forefront of the climate crisis. And we will provide multilingual tools and cross-disciplinary trainings. Before concluding, let me extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who have contributed towards the success of this excellent knowledge building initiative. Let me highlight in particular that the positive outcomes of this conference could not be achieved without the general support of the Swedish Postcode Foundation, to which I am personally very, very grateful. I wish to sincerely thank as well all our esteemed speakers and panelists and our partners of the five innovation sites for strengthening our global efforts to safeguard heritage, reduce disaster risk, and promote inclusive climate action. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not extend a big special thank you to my ICROM colleagues, especially from the ICROM FAR team, who work tirelessly and with such a great commitment and dedication for the organization of this very successful conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Director General, for those warm words and inspiring uh, uh, message, giving us encouragement to move on. And taking from your words, it's now time for a formal vote of thanks, which is my proud privilege to present. And on behalf of Ikram, I would like to now present a formal vote of thanks. I would like to start by underscoring Collaboration, innovation, and learning together were at the heart of this net of the Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action project, which you just mentioned. And this culminating conference, heritage-based climate action, was also an example of this in a, in incredible collaboration. Such work cannot be undertaken without strong and committed partnerships which is evident in the overwhelming response we have received in the form of over 1,400 registrations and diversity in the conference contributors. The contributors range from climate scientists to disaster risk reduction specialists, ecologists, peace builders, community members, indigenous knowledge bearers, policy advisors, and storytellers. On behalf of Ikram, I extend our heartfelt gratitude to the Swedish Postcode Foundation for backing this initiative and enabling ICROM to experiment as well as gather evidence from the field on how culture and heritage can help advance climate action. The Net Zero Initiative and the Heritage-Based Climate Action Conference also benefited from the generous support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the uh, and uh, and the Ministry of Culture Government of Italy, as well as Government of the Principality of Monaco. We express our gratitude to our member states, all our member states, and are particularly grateful to the Prime Minister's Office of Barbados, Ministry of Culture of United Arab Emirates, Special Rapporteur in the Field of Cultural Rights, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNESCO, and the University of Pennsylvania, for their invaluable contributions to our inaugural session. We celebrate and salute the knowledge bearers and we are grateful to them for sustaining some of the last surviving biodiverse areas and culturally rich places and their worldviews to build a culture of we instead of me have set us on a path of an inspiring journey. We owe special thanks to all conference contributors, particularly the young leaders who represented more than 30 institutions and 20 disciplines, including the partners of our five net zero Heritage for Climate Action innovation sites from the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation, Egypt, 
Sudan Urban Development Think Tank, Sudan, GRIID Corps, India, Cross Cultural Foundation of Uganda, and Unicamp, Brazil. This collaborative effort truly paved the way for wider implementation of heritage-based climate action, as well as open new avenues for advocating for the integration of heritage concerns into wider disaster risk reduction and climate action uh, uh, policies and programs. We take this opportunity to also thank all departments at ECROM, especially the Office of the Director General, the Information Technology and Logistics Office, and Communications uh, and Partnerships uh, Unit, uh, and also all the other colleagues who have been working tirelessly with us uh, in support to, to organize this event. And without their support, this would not have the this conference would not have been possible. I thank everyone once again for being here with us and together joining us in building knowledge over the past three days. We hope to bring you the uh, findings of this conference very soon, as well as uh, the, next, the, the case studies, the culture climate stories will be published in an open source publication as already mentioned by our director general. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night to all of you, or, or, or good morning to some of you who are joining us from the other part of the world. Thank you.